So we did a thing. Yeah, we've been talking about this forever. Once we started biking regularly and biking further and further every time we biked, like we went from, hey, let's bike 40 miles. That'll be a whole day thing to biking a century almost every weekend that we could during the quarantine. Yeah, it mainly because I remember when I was commuting and we were biking pretty much every day. A long bike for me was going over across the GWB to New Jersey. And so basically, that's about 40 miles. Uh, sometimes we'd go down to Rockaway. That's about 50. Yeah. So it's like we were starting to expand our range. And we always biked a lot for like the past decade. It's it's a primary way of us getting around the city. But when the pandemic happened in 2020, you know, a lot of the other stuff we enjoyed was suddenly taken away from us. Like we can't hang out with our friends. We can't go to movies, no film festivals, no, you know, museums or fun get togethers, like all social interaction that you'd have in a city dried up. So it was basically like the main forms of like outlet of energy we had were cooking, which is kind of like a basic thing we had to do just, you know, day-to-day -day life. And also we started doing a lot of athletics. Like you would run these half marathons, right? Like I you pretty much <laughs> ran a half marathon every weekend for the first two years of the COVID quarantine. Yeah. He'd like just go by himself and pick, uh, pick not too traveled streets and just kind of run for hours. And, uh, then, you know, in the summer, we started just getting on our bike and doing the trailways up through the Bronx and to Yonkers and past. And I remember before this all happened, I used to say, oh, wouldn't it be cool? We could bike to Beacon and stay overnight. And that was like my idea of a huge trip. Like someday I'm going to be good enough to bike to Beacon. Because now it sounds funny. Beacon's like 74-ish yeah. <laughs> miles north of here. Like that's an easy ride. It's, it's not. Now I know better. It's not as fun to bike to Beacon because you have to get off the trailway and go along like country roads for a while. And there's, there's certain like mountains and stuff you don't really have great time crossing. But, uh, you know, when it was 2020, there was a point at which I think we had gone to Terrytown up past Yonkers. It's like where uh, where Sleepy Hollow takes place, basically. And we just happened to hit like 95 miles when we got back home. And so I was like, come on, let's do the first century. So, so we so biked we, around the neighborhood until Strava <laughs> said we'd gone 100 we miles. We basically like biked up, up by the river for five miles and went back home. And so that was like, yeah, first century. And we were so accomplished. But then we started doing it. And then we biked to Poughkeepsie and took the train back home. And, you know, we, we did that a bunch of times. And it got to the point by 2022 where it was kind of like, oh, first century of the year, let's go. And that was around when I started thinking of my grandfather's birthday. So in 2019, I was back home in Rochester, New York area, where I grew up. And uh, my grandfather was turning 90. And as a big celebration, we decided to get all the family together. And we rented a barge and went up and down the Erie Canal, you know, just kind of slowly eating dinner and singing songs and partying on a boat. And it was really nice. You know, I hung around with all the aunties and everything and, you know, celebrated my grandfather's long life. And, uh, you know, there was some of the guides who were driving the boat. And this lady was telling me, say, oh, look at that trail over there. You can take that all the way to New York City. And that was when I first realized how you know, solid the New York State Greenway was and the fact that in recent years that infrastructure project had been completed and people did in this In fact, it tour. was completed in December of 2020. It'd been in under construction for like three or four years. So there'd be a segment here and a segment there. And I mean, like, look at even our route where we'd go up to the South County Trailway in 2020. I remember they were still working on parts of uh, Van Cortland. Well, our options Park. were either bike a crappy way up and around and then get to the trailway like further upstate or... 
uh, climb a fence and go through the trail that was not officially open yet that was full of cyclists was... who were also climbing the fences. People were cutting holes in the fence that were bike-sized. It yeah. was a whole thing. But like everybody would like share the information. So you'd see like people with bikes going into the woods. You'd be like, ah, ah, that is the way to go. And so everybody, you know, they would just be walking their bikes and you'd be like, there must be a hole in the fence there. So everybody was just taking this this trail, even though it wasn't completed and you know, and then there was one time all the trees fell over during a storm. And, you know, so we were lucky that we picked the right time to get into long distance biking because this magnificent trail across the entire United or entire New York state had just recently been completed. So. Yep. So we just decided to actually plan the trip and I just took the time off and we felt like we were ready. We didn't. We kind of almost overtrained for this. Like, I think we put this off longer than we could have. We talked about it during the pandemic. After we started doing those rides up to Poughkeepsie periodically, it's like you always want to kind of push yourself and you're always kind of testing the limits. Like, okay, I did a 20 mile hike. Could I do a 30 mile hike? You know, it's kind of like, you know, and there becomes a point where you kind of was like, well, I don't really want to go beyond this. I don't want to do like these crazy double black diamond jump off the top of a cliff kind of things. But, you know, I, I do want to improve in skiing. And so we went to Poughkeepsie and then there was always this feeling of, well, what's next? What's beyond this? And we talked about it all summer. And I think part of the reason we started to, uh, to decide that then was the time was one, it was getting toward fall. So it was a little cooler and uh, also, uh, we were going to have a memorial at some point for my grandfather who passed away in 2020 and my uncle who passed away in 2021. And so this would be a way to get all the local family together. And so I said, what if we bike out to my parents' house and do this memorial service? And that's basically what we did. Yep. So long story short, our first cycling trip ever, like literally first the, first touring. Time, the first time we ever did a multi-day cycling trip, we uh, just went off on the road and after about a week went 485 miles all the way to your granddad's house uh, outside in the outskirts of Rochester. Yeah. And then collapsed on the lawn. But I think uh, the biggest thing is you were really the one who put the most planning into it. Well, okay, I so was, what, what did we do to plan this? Well, actually, it's you a, found the luggage. The luggage was really important. So let's talk about what we did before we got on the road. Yeah, well, I would say, well, one, if any of you listening to this think you want to do a long cycling trip and you're worried about it, all I'm going to say, like the, the summary of all this prep work is that we were definitely overprepared yeah. in the sense that this was way way easier than I expected it to be. I expected more three or four times the amount of hassle we actually experienced. Yeah. Like I, I expected us to have more mechanical problems. I expected us to be more worn out. Mm -hmm. I was as fit as we are. I wasn't sure how we do on the fourth day of yeah. biking between 70 and 80 miles a day. <laughs> I thought my legs were going to be wrecked and it turned out I I'll get to that later. <laughs> but the, uh, the main thing, the two areas where money really helped us, but you could do it on a budget and just be less comfortable is one, we stayed in hotels every night. We did not camp. You know, I know there's a lot of people. We ran into people along the trail who were just sleeping rough in a little, in a little tent. And the other thing is we had very good equipment. Like I got my SPDs. I trained on them during the summer. It made a huge difference in the amount of energy it took to, to go a certain distance. You know, I really uh, basically recommend if you're into biking above 40 miles, you know, or even if you're biking every day on a commute, it might be worth it to look at like clipless shoes that like the cleats that just attach to your pedal and then it Well, because I've been bugging you energy. to install them for years I was and you didn't. I was scared of it. To be honest, it was one of those things that, you know, after I got them, I just immediately loved them. And it was kind of like, I can't believe I put this off for so long. I'm so stupid, you know. But I, everybody always told me, oh, well, it's hard to get used to and you fall over all the time or you, you have to practice on grass because you'll fall over. And I think the biggest thing with me, there were close calls with me. Like the time when my, I, I almost lost a screw <laughs> from my cleat, but mm -hmm. 
you know, it, it basically, I was way more scared of falling over than I probably should have been. Um, and I found it a, a huge asset to my biking. I wouldn't want to do this trip without uh, cleats. But basically, in terms of, you know, almost over preparing. So what we started doing is we knew this trail, if nothing else, whatever the route would be, we would basically go to Poughkeepsie on the way. So the bike trip that we'd been doing over and over and over again, uh, just because we enjoyed it, that was about what the trip would be. So training wise, we wanted to make sure that we'd be able to do that kind of biking consistently. Yeah. So we started doing the ride to Poughkeepsie and trying to do it faster without wrecking ourselves. Yeah. And I remember the time before the the last century we rode before we rested and got ready for this trip, we actually like really tried to push ourselves and tried to get to Poughkeepsie like as fast as we could with as few breaks as we could. And I think we both said like we set <laughs> so many personal bests on Strava. Yeah. And the word and the funniest part was, I think we were both less wrecked at the end of that century where we pushed like crazy yeah. than we were on a lot of the previous ones because well, we'd been doing it so much. You had been training with your panniers. You instead of doing a backpack, you had been, you know, putting one of your little luggage containers on your bike when we do these Poughkeepsie well, trips. I carry all the snacks and food yeah. because we figured I'm the you know, I'm the one who runs half marathons. I would be the yeah, one who would carry so the bulk like, of okay, the weight. So I was like, okay, okay, strong guy. You can, you can, you know, you, he, he's got those big, you know, big chunky athlete thighs. I was like, let's go. Well, you you know, can I'm, carry I'm, it. Uh, <laughs> not, not to, not to humble, not to brag at all, yeah. but uh, I am shockingly fast on my bike. Yeah. Well, <laughs> just in general. The, the doctor at your physical is like, hey, are you a, an athlete? And so that always feels kind of good. But anyway, so you had been training with the panniers. I think I was slower on the Poughkeepsie leg when we actually got going. Well, we did that on I purpose, had though. Luggage we <laughs> purposely, because I was carrying weight. We purposefully, on the actual trip, went a lot slower and really paced ourselves on that first day compared to what we were doing normally. Because we normally got into a cadence where we planned on biking exactly 102 miles, and then we'd eat a dinner and like get on a train home, as opposed to wake up at dawn the next day and just go. We wouldn't take a lot of breaks. We'd usually like break for lunch, maybe stop to get like ice cream and a bagel or something at the uh, yeah. We're literally the talking point. two yeah, to like three fifty miles stop and like then two to three stops total on this hundred yeah. mile ride. So a century, honestly, like got pretty easy for us. Yeah. But it's a nice it's a nice ride too. But it's, in retrospect, it's really pleasant. It's very clear that that was not necessary. <laughs> uh, most people who do cycle touring do not take the do not ridiculously start with aggressive pace. <laughs> That we took. Yeah. I mean, we weren't insane about it in that we didn't do multiple centuries in a row, which I think your initial planning had us going like 180, 80 or something like that. And it was much better when we stretched it into 60 mile days instead of 80 mile days. Well, yeah, that was partly only because of the storm, though. Yeah. So since we knew so. we could bike 100 miles and we felt like we were pretty much ready for it, I just spent a couple of days in Google Maps looking at the route. I got all the GPS coordinates together and... Just figuring out about how far we could go per day. I shot for, you know, we knew it was 485 miles. So I shot for 68 miles a day meant we could do it in seven days if there was no trouble. Uh, assuming that we do the century the first day, it would be the hardest day. Yeah. And therefore, arguably, literally every day after that would have been easier. So, so front loaded. The, the average had to be around 70 miles a day, but it could fluctuate quite a bit because if the first day was 100, the rest of the days could be less than 70 and it would be fine. But then actually planning the route was a little bit tricky in that there are a lot of nothings between uh, some of these waypoints. Like you get out of some towns along the way and there's a 70 mile stretch of the bike trail where there really aren't hotels. There aren't really restaurants anywhere near the trail. There is nowhere to stop and there's nowhere to eat. So I had to sort of granola bars all day. So I had to sort of just really spend a few days looking at waypoints and I'll share the map. Anyone who listens to this, you can look at the map. But basically we had a, I originally planned a six day trip, then I planned a seven day trip and then an eight day trip. And that way we had three different versions of the trip overlaid on a map with different points that were guaranteed food, that were guaranteed hotel, all the different options we could have. So if something went wrong, we had like an increasing number of fallback plans and fallback destinations along the way. And that took, took a few days of effort. That was actually the most annoying part. I'd say that was the hardest part of the entire trip. 
compared to the biking. And I really appreciate that you did that because your, I, I guess your organizational skills are very good and you're pretty good about planning travel. So you're kind of like, okay, what timing wise, like we need to reach our destination by sundown. It's about here. You did a really, really tight. But like, I got to say between Schenectady yeah. and Utica, like <laughs> there really aren't places to stop. It's, it's and a little hard bit mode, sparse. <laughs> because of COVID, we were still trying to avoid indoor dining as much as possible, yeah. which meant we had to find places we could eat outdoors or get takeaway. And luckily the weather was mostly good on our trip. Yeah. So do you want to talk a little bit about what we packed? Just quick, go through oh, our- yeah. So training all set, you know, we did all our training, we we're ready to go. And honestly, the one most important thing I would have to say is if you ever do a trip like this, if nothing else, you have to spend money on good, comfortable biking jerseys Really good, really comfortable chamois. Butt pads. And honestly, get the Ortlieb pannier. Just yeah. Google for it. You'll it's like there's only one. Everyone who does cycle touring uses Ortlieb. They seem to be literally the best. There's no question. Almost everyone, in fact, I think a hundred percent of the people we saw who were similarly touring had Ortlieb had branded Ortlieb. panniers, like across the, the board. The guy from Germany. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I definitely think our philosophy, just like you in office chairs, it's basically like we do tend to go for like a moderately priced luggage, but we tend to go for well-designed stuff. <laughs> you know, screw bells and whistles or fancy designer or anything. I want a piece of luggage or a piece of athletic equipment that I can depend on and that I know is, you know, has that design. And so you will be spending a bit of money up front on your luggage, but it's going to be worth it. Well, it's they last like, forever. That, like an orderly so pannier will last you yeah. the rest of your life. I, I remember we were biking in Prospect Park not too long before we did this trip. And we ended up talking to some guy we were riding with and he was like, oh, I've had these things 15 years. Yeah. And, and they're totally waterproof and yada, yada. So it's it's very funny. I'll get to that in a second. But like, I feel that people who notice your panniers and they're like, ah, it's kind of like an anime nerd seeing an anime t-shirt being like, aha, this is somebody who enjoys my same interests. Oh yeah. On the rest of the trip, that was, and it started with day one, but, but the funniest thing was Normally when we bike, like other cyclists, unless we're stopped somewhere, like you might wave or like do a pleasant hello, but you don't really talk much. But yeah. if you have fully loaded looking panniers on your bike. If you're obviously touring. Everyone who bike tours like pulls up next to you if you're going the same direction and like asks about your destination. Like, oh, hey, yeah. all right, where are you headed? How far are you into the trip? And it was a pattern that persisted. So if you want to meet people, even if you're not bike touring, just put your panniers on <laughs> throw, your bike and put a pillow in each one so they look like they're full. <laughs> and I guarantee almost every cycling tourist person you pass will literally talk to you un like unexpectedly and want to know about your trip. I mean, I saw a guy who was doing bike touring on the West Coast when we were in Seattle for PAX and the police officers, they weren't like messing with him for anything. They were just like really curious, like, you mean you biked all the way from California kind of thing. So it's like people will notice your baggage and be like, what you doing <laughs> kind of thing. Now, in terms of bikes, we used our regular old hybrids, like yeah. carbon fork in the front, regular old like bike aluminum kinda, uh, body. Kind of sturdy, not super racy, you know, very medium upright posture. And I got to say... Uh, a lot of bike cycling people were trying to tell us that we should get drop bars and have like a road bike. But I would say the far majority of touring people we passed, they were on hybrids like ours yeah. or even less aggressive bikes. And they were not riding road bikes. I think we saw one touring person in the entire trip who had an actual road bike as opposed to a hybrid. I mean, I think I am super glad we didn't try to get uh, oh, a road bike posture would be so uncomfortable <laughs> so, no matter how much arrow it saved you. So, I mean, like the, what you'd make up for in speed, there were so many like gravel parts of the trail, so many like bits of slightly rough terrain that weren't quite mountain bike worthy, but were just, it, it felt a lot like us biking in New York where you got to be careful of potholes or rugged pavement or that kind of thing. And so well, never yeah. mind just the comfort of sitting more upright. Yeah. Like psych a high speed cycling posture is not the touring posture. So I would actually say if you want to try this and you're mostly a road biker, I would recommend renting or buying a hybrid 
or something easier for a trip like this. The only change I would make to my bike, and I might just do this anyway, is I think I want to add some horns. Some of those, you know, you see bikes, they have like two extra handlebars that are kind of facing forward, like little goat horns on the edges of their handlebars. I think I would get some of those installed, not like full on ones with controls or anything, just something to rest on because you don't really need to shift or touch your brakes much on a trip like this. You're pretty much just cruising for yeah. hours at a time comfortably at a steady pace. Yep. Uh, that's, that's why having, having the SPDs, it just felt like I almost imagined myself like part of the machine. It's like I'm lacking in the pistons and ready to get going. And then those, uh, those machine would just keep cranking. Yep. So in terms of packing, we packed honestly in a couple areas, a little too light, but frankly, in a couple other areas, we packed way too much. Uh, like we brought seven tubes and we didn't have a single flight. We actually had zero mechanical problems the entire trip. It Nothing was, went wrong. It was probably good. We had like, that's the part I don't want to over prepare because there would have been parts we'd be stranded. Well, also because there are like hundred mile segments where yeah. there are no bike shops or even like easily accessible roads. Like it would yeah. not have been easy to get somewhere like to a bike shop. So uh, if we'd had a problem, it would have been a big problem, but Literally, we could have gotten away with bringing like three tubes. We would have been fine. So we each had about 1.5 regular casual clothes outfits and three kits of the, you know, padded shorts and cycling jerseys. And so we were, we had planned on at some point doing laundry along the way. We did laundry twice along the way. So basically we had three changes of clothes, which actually is pretty pretty generous compared to like some bike people talk about. I mean, a lot of people we met brought a lot more with them. Uh, We didn't bring any cold weather gear really, which was a problem on the last day. Yeah. And you know, so be prepared first aid kit. Um, Another thing that was absolutely vital was the chamois butter. Yeah. Just cover your butt in lube every (laughs) single day. Put on way more than you think you need. It's, it's bike lube but not for your bike. It's for your butt. And so you put it all over your ass and then you don't get as much chafing. That's the main thing. It's like, you've got to, that was the biggest problem. It wasn't muscle soreness. It's just, how do I sit on this, you know, funny little seat going really fast for a whole day without absolutely destroying my butt bones. Now, even then, like we, we did all that biking. We did up to that point was important because you'll get a lot of extra problems beyond just chafing. If you don't accustom your butt to being in the saddle. Yeah. But again, as we discovered on the trip, most people doing a trip like this, uh, did about half the hours in the saddle per day that we did. We're just nuts. Apparently. So basic toiletries, yada, yada, bring your toothbrush. And we also brought a little bit of medicine. Like I had medicine and then we brought ibuprofen. So after a hard day's work, keep your inflammation down. Yeah, we basically had vitamin I every day after the trip. And that really, that saved me. That That was a night and day thing. And if you're in a place that won't totally get all weird. Yeah, we brought edibles too. We brought, I have we brought ibuprofen cannabis. and an edible every evening yeah, it after that kind of riding. You pretty much just go straight to sleep. I, we, yeah. we would get, <laughs> after we ate dinner, we would just go straight to sleep every night. Yeah. So we'd basically come in, be completely wrecked, shower, get nice and clean, change into our casual clothes outfit, and then just like flop. And yep. we'd just be lying down, just like chilling, looking at our phones, having a good conversation. I literally only brought one shirt, one pair of pants, yeah. and uh, one pair of boxers to use as pajamas. And that's the only non-biking clothes I even had. Yep. And then water bottles. Uh, we use Camelbacks, so we carry most of our water supply on our backs over the course of the day. Yep. In the start of the trip, I carried a lot more because stopping, I wasn't sure exactly how easily we'd be able to refill and stop along the way because yeah. some of the trail segments are pretty remote. But as the trip went on, I just carried less and less water every day. Yeah. We, we kind of figured, you know, figure out how much we go through per day, figure out the temperature. We probably used less water because it was a little bit chillier. And uh, then, you know, also a little bit snack. You want uh, those muesli bars, those little cookies and stuff that you can kind of boost your blood sugar if you're stopping in the middle of the day. Well, so, also, I pretty much was eating constantly on the whole trip because yeah. we couldn't, we weren't going to stop and eat that often yeah. on a trip like this. And 
like some of these segments, there really were no good places to stop and eat that really lined up with our aggressive schedule. So I was pretty much just constantly eating in the saddle the whole time. I was just eating sugar gels yeah. and granola bars and peanuts. And uh, the advice I've always heard from cyclists, and this is just regular cyclists too, not even touring, is if you're doing hard long distances, just eat constantly and eat way more than you think you need to and you'll it'll work out fine. So a big thing that I found worked really well for me is... Big carb breakfast and big carb and protein dinner and then little sugar stuff in between. So it's like I'm munching on a little potato chip. I'm munching on a little sugar. I think I ate about a pound of peanuts on you the know? first half of the trip. So you're, so you're eating nuts. You're eating these snacks along the way, but I'm not really eating heavily well. I'm actually in the middle of the ride. So, yeah. And my only regrets uh, in terms of packing is... Well, like I said, we didn't need nearly as many tubes, uh, and I had the bare minimum repair equipment. I think we were good on that front. Uh, we actually didn't bring the GoPro, and I don't regret that, because it would have just been a distraction. I would have had to fuss with the whole time. Yeah. But I really should have brought more chamois, because <laughs> you can just re-wear a dirty bike jersey Yeah, over jerseys and over are and over fine. Again. They just smell a little sweaty. It is kind of dangerous to re-wear a chamois unless you wash it. <laughs> yeah, it's just... You you don't want that. Well, it's not only nasty. are they gross, but your skin's going to be a little chafed and irritated on a bike lift trip like this. You get an infection. Yeah. You know, it, it's bad. You know, we were lucky in that neither of us, because some people get blisters on their sits bones, but... That's usually caused by cheap chamois, bad bike seats, or bad cycling posture, or yeah. people who try to do this without accustoming their bodies to yeah. it. Yeah, so it we, doesn't being Being fit, like... Super fit does not necessarily matter on a trip like this as much as being accustomed to riding a bike. Yeah. Case in point, one of the couples we met along the way, they were like double our age and they were doing almost the exact same trip in the opposite direction. They were just going 40 miles a day instead yeah. of 80 miles a day. Let's Okay, let's go through the trip because I want to talk about them. I want to talk about some of the characters yeah, we'll go we day, we'll met go day, along we'll the way. We'll go day by day. But, yeah. but the last bits are on prep. I wish we'd brought more chamois because depending on the timing and the weather and all the things that happen on the road, it is difficult to have enough time to wash chamois and have them be dry enough to use the next day. You don't want to put those in a yeah. dryer. It'll often ruin them. Yeah. And most hotels, unless you stay at like a Best Western, don't even have washing facilities. So like you'll get to, we hit to a point where all our chamois were going to be dirty. So we hit a deadline now of this day, we have to wash them yeah. at some point or we are screwed. And we couldn't even do the trick I wanted to do of let's wash a few and like hang them off the back of the bike. So they'll dry like on the way to the next destination. It rained Because on it was us. pouring rain. <laughs> so if I had to change our packing on this trip, I would bring one or two fewer cycling jerseys because I can just wear the same one over and over yeah. again. I'd bring one super heavy duty warm one, no matter how hot it is outside, yeah. just in case. And I would double the number of chamois I brought at the expense of most of my other equipment. Yeah. Bring bring extra underwear. <laughs> I would almost say bring enough chamois to make yeah. it the whole trip without having to do laundry. And when I say underwear, I mean literally bike shorts. They're not underwear, but because you wear them on the outside. So. Yeah, I just changed into the same like <laughs> pair of tech pants every restaurant along the way. Yeah. So we started off bright and early. I, I felt like that little bit of pre-ride trepidation, but I was mostly just excited. I was well, taking off in the middle of a very heavy work schedule, but I was kind of like, I'm doing it. And they can, you know, they can deal with it. I'm going to do this. This is important. Yep. I had wrapped up all my stuff at work and we kind of just had an, an, an evening to sit down and look at all our stuff and like play everything out and be ready to go. And we had some burgers and beer. At we the fed bar the bunny. Next door, you know, and uh, we, we just prepared and I was like, okay. And one thing that we hadn't good. done, which was, uh, it ended up being totally fine. But when we first set out, it was basically exactly the same as all of our centuries, which almost made it easier. Like, just walk out the door yeah. at like 6 a.m. and just start riding it. like we do every weekend, <laughs> except instead of having a lightly packed pannier, or in your case, no panniers, we had four fully packed tannier, panniers, and neither one of us had ever, ever biked with full panniers before. And you know what? It's totally fine. Yeah. It's actually, there's I, no I difficulty at all. Yeah, it was, it was great. And the weather was good. And so we hit our regular trail. We're up in the Bronx and this dude comes up next to us. And he's also got like, obviously he's a cyclist. He's got the full kit. He's like, 
you know, coming along with some cool, he's got a little bag. He doesn't have a big bag, but you know, he, he's obviously prepared and does a lot of this kind of thing. And he was like, Oh, are you guys touring? And we're like, heck yeah. You know, we're going to Buffalo and you know, which that was the route we were taking. He was the one who was even like, oh yeah, I talked to you because of your panniers. And yeah. as we talked, he was like, everyone who's got panniers is going to talk to you. It's like a secret code. And it was funny because he was like super overly friendly to the point where I was like, wow, this guy is kind of like that friendly nerd at a convention who's just like, want to talk to you. But he was really nice. And it was just like, you know, we rode for like 20 miles together. Well, so we're just swapping stories of like other bike trips yeah. we've both done. And the most interesting part is... Dude was definitely like a cyclist with a capital C yeah. compared to us. Like yeah. he could book. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, while we were riding next to each other, it was a, it was a weird feeling when we were thinking like, oh, this guy is a super pro. Like, I yeah. wonder what he thinks of us. And then when he starts asking about our route, his first reaction was, that is a lot Holy of miles shit. per day. Yeah. What the <laughs> fuck is wrong with you? Yeah. But, you know, it, it was it was kind of cool because I felt like the miles to our, our waypoint where we usually stop and and take a little break, uh, they just kind of melted away. And he he continued on. I think he was going to Terrytown or wherever. Just having, just like us, having a regular Sunday ride, you know? Yeah. And then, so. like, shortly after that, you know, we keep biking. And we're on one of those bridges, like, in the middle of nowhere. That's about the furthest that we normally ride if we're doing a yeah. round trip back to the city. And when we yeah. get up to that point, we pass our second person who's in panniers. And we took pictures of each other. She yeah. asked us to take her picture and we noticed the panniers. They said, where are you headed? You know, and she said, up to Montreal. And we were like, oh, we're taking the same route, but we're going to Buffalo. And we we kind of talked a little bit about like, you know, waypoints. And we mentioned Hudson and, and she told us, uh, oh, I've been up there and there's this really cute cafe. And so that's the other thing is, is people you meet, they are very helpful in that they want to tell you stuff they've accumulated knowledge and they want to share it yep stop in this town don't stop in this town here's yeah. the good and if you've talked to these cycling tourists every single town along the way they know the place the, that is bike like, friendly there's like the cyclist restaurant and like our friend you, you know scott of geek nights he definitely has the cycling buddies and they all have these like oh yeah that ice cream place that grocery store that restaurant and so everybody knows these waypoints and loves to help a help a fellow cyclist out. So I uh, I think we left on a Friday. So I was technically blowing off work, and my phone kept ringing. And I was like, Oh no, it's probably my boss who needs something because everything's always an emergency and on fire. Turned out it was my mom. And while we were we were stopped, she was like, Oh yeah, we were thinking of having the memorial on. Friday, uh, the next Friday. So we're like, oh, we have exactly a week to make it. And that actually gives us a buffer day. So we were planning, you know, we're going to go home, sleep the night at my parents' house, and then, uh, you know, do the, the family get together. So. So day one, all told, like in terms of the riding, yeah. we rode 102 miles yeah. over the course of about nine hours in the saddle. Yeah. And we gained half a mile of elevation. Yeah. That's what we do all the time. And we went through the great swamp, which is just slowly week a week a week uphill. But it just felt great, partly because we'd been training so hard and we really forced ourselves, even though we didn't need it, to take breaks and to go at a slower pace than we normally would mm -hmm. on this day one. Because this, you know, we'd never gone beyond this point before. We had never biked this far and not had a beer and taken a train home and slept in the next day. So one thing I want to mention about Poughkeepsie. Coming into Poughkeepsie, uh, I, I like Poughkeepsie. It was fun, but I don't ever want to do this trip again, biking all the way to Poughkeepsie, because Poughkeepsie is not actually a great place to stay yeah. the night on a cycling trip. So one... There aren't a lot of hotels in Poughkeepsie and we ended up paying the, the hotel we stayed in. The Poughkeepsie Grand is a fancy hotel there. It is. It was more expensive by double than any other hotel or motel we stayed at. It was the at one any by the point along the trip. Yeah. And I got to tell you, Poughkeepsie, we were it's interrupted overnight by not one, but two illegal street drag races. <laughs> it was the, the fast and the furious out there. I swear to gosh. I'm we, pretty we sure the woke second up one and it was, was broken like up by the cops. There was all sorts of like yelling and shenanigans and police nonsense outside our hotel all night long, which you know, I used to live in Poughkeepsie and yeah, yeah that's kind of how it was. Yeah. But two, it's I was a tough worried. town. 
Because the other thing I was worried about on a trip like this is a lot of hotels and a lot of businesses in general get weird about bikes. Like they won't let you bring the bike inside or they freak out at you if the bike is in the wrong place. And I was we we weren't prepared for that. I was low key worried about that the whole way, especially because we were staying in the super fancy hotel in Poughkeepsie. So we come up to the the concierge desk and the front desk and, you know, we're a little bit timid. I'm like, can we take our bikes up in the lake? Goes, oh gosh, yes. Definitely take your bikes into the room. You know, don't yeah, leave them down said, here. They will definitely be stolen. <laughs> they will if definitely you leave be stolen. Out. And everybody was really nice. And we stopped at our usual pub. There's a, there's a, a microbrewery called Zeus. And I, I recommend it if you're in Poughkeepsie because, you know, this is kind of a bar and grill food, but just really really good mozzarella sticks and hearty fare. And we were so hungry. It really hit the spot. And the other weird story about Poughkeepsie is while we're biking in, we just see these rabbits out in the middle of like a side yard and they're just like mooching around. Like between two like small, like French style apartment buildings. Yeah. There's just these These two rabbits rabbits that from a distance, I'm like, those kind of look like domestic rabbits. (laughs) Unsupervised. We both both like weren't sure how to react at first. Like they were just, they were chilling and they seemed happy and and just doing their thing. But we're just both like, we stop and we're like, huh. Huh. Like, okay. So I've been sort of involved with rabbit rescue off and on for like years and years. And people dump rabbits a ton you know just like people do with with other animals they're just like go be free in the middle of the city (laughs) like just let them go in a park and I was like oh gosh I hope somebody didn't decide to dump a rabbit because then I don't really have time to deal with this I'm not near home yeah we're at the end of our day (laughs) we're we're literally this is in the last mile of our 102 mile day one ride we're just we you know we're looking at these rabbits like okay do we like somebody or call somebody i go over to check and it out luckily, i'm like all right let's see i'm gonna test if these are truly domestic rabbits or like well, what they're you know is. they were domestic rabbits but they were obviously not feral they weren't scared of people at oh, all oh yeah i walk so over one of, the, poke one of them at presented and, let me pet her yeah, and the other like, one was chill. Petting these little rabbits and then this lady comes up and you know she obviously lives in a nearby apartment she said do you know anybody? Is, are these rabbits belonging to somebody? He said, oh yeah, those are so-and-sos. He just kind of let some graze in the yard. And, you know, so, the one got hit by a car, which was really sad, but, you know, he just kind of lets them run around. I was like, okay, but, you know, they belong to somebody. He's like, oh yeah. And so I was like, okay, you know, I guess I'll, I'll let that be. And the, the little kid obviously had interacted with the rabbit. Well, the a kid lot. was like, was yelling, I want to stay and pet Hoppy. Hopla. <laughs> or hopla, hopla. I want to pet Hopla. Yeah, the anyway. mom was definitely like, does not super approve of this whole yeah, situation. It's, it's a little bit kind of like, you know, but then I, I thought about it. I'm like, you know, I'd rather have rabbits who are like in a little bit of danger, but they're just generally kept free range and like people who let their cats wander around you know it's like cats can get hit by predators they can get hit by cars you know as long as there's somebody at the end of the day who cares for these animals that you know that's that's well really, i was confident they were really doing good having an okay life partly because they're long-haired rabbits yeah yet they, they were had fuzzy and well they well-groomed. had zero mats they they, <laughs> they definitely they these rabbits get brushed every night so someone's looking out for them anyway Brief rabbit interlude. I just did not expect to see two domestic rabbits grazing in someone's lawn, just like by the road (laughs) in the middle of Poughkeepsie. Just by by themselves, all all on their own. They were they were good little guys. So that was first night, and we we went to bed and in our expensive hotel. And which honestly, for being the fanciest and most expensive hotel in Poughkeepsie, it's actually pretty rundown and dingy. Yeah, it's like I said, it's the convention center <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah, that that place was not worth five hundred dollars a night. Yeah, uh, uh, no, it wasn't. <laughs> but that hotel seems to exist solely for people's weddings. Yeah. So as a result. It had a breakfast Good buffet. Good breakfast. And the breakfast buffet was like a gigantic, hearty, really good one because it's a breakfast buffet for all the weddings that happened the night before. Yeah. And we got up early. There wasn't anyone really down there yet. So we just loaded up three plates full of food and got on our way. Kind of kind of rubbing shoulders with uh, all the hungover party guests and stuff. And so, yeah. We got so, up bright and early, and I so was surprisingly two, not sore. And that was pretty much the theme. Like, this was the waking up the next morning, where we only had a 60-mile ride the next day planned, but 
that was the moment of truth because we'd never biked further than that before. We were going to bike about 500 yards and then we would be at the furthest point we'd ever been on furthest our bikes. Out, if I take one more step, it's the furthest outside the Shire I've ever been. So day so. two, 60 miles we had to do in about six hours that ended up taking us mm-hmm. and another half mile of elevation gain. Yep. And this was the trip to a town called Hudson. So the route was basically now from Poughkeepsie in uncharted territory. We go over this gigantic pedestrian bridge. Beautiful walkway across we'll the Hudson. We'll go around the west side of the river for a while north. Then we'll go back over the Hudson on another bridge and then go the rest of the way north to this little town called Hudson. So we we cross the bridge from Poughkeepsie. And that's the first time in all the time we've been coming up to Poughkeepsie that we actually went all the way across the bridge. Yeah, the first time we made it to that bridge, we didn't even go all the way across it because I had chafed my butt so badly because that was the first- Well, your knee hurt too. My knee was busted and I'd chafed my butt pretty badly. So we didn't even go over the bridge. We just booked to Zeus to get some food and then got GTFO'd. Yeah. And then, uh, so we started going into more woodsy territory. And then- we pass this part where there are all these like deep echoey caves down along the side of the trailway. And like you'd you'd shout and your voice would echo into this darkness. It was really cool looking. And we found out it was a huge mining area. And Specifically these were... cement, a very specific kind of cement that's mostly only found in this area. And it's still usable to this day. And it's a really important natural resource. And so this is where our, our sturdy bikes came into play. And, you know, we're going over stone dust and in some cases gravel and doing a little bit more of trail riding than street riding. Yep. I mean, the entire route, literally the entire route, with the exception of maybe 500 to 750 yards in one town where you have to get on the road once, was entirely paved asphalt. And from this point on, the trail is a mix of stone dust, which is basically ground up rocks compacted pretty tightly. And it's it's very similar it's to bikeable. asphalt in terms of biking. It's bikeable. It's, uh, it's not the best, but it's, it's yep. totally fine. But some some of the segments are not actually stone dust, despite calling themselves stone dust. It's just gravel. It's just dirt <laughs> road. Some of it was just dirt road straight up, yeah. and some of it was actual full-on road riding. <laughs> and some of it was single track mountain biking. So the coolest part of this segment is, so we're biking through this part with all these little caves and such, and we passed this little shack with like a little kitchen attached to it. it. It looked like a little like witch house in the woods. And there's tables and chairs set up. This tiny little coffee shop is set up along the trail and run by, I'm assuming, based on like the general aesthetic and all like the books they had around. They're kind of like the yoga ladies who are yeah. into like meditation and stuff. And uh, they they made a really good, uh, like, rose, was it lavender lemonade or something? Well, we this had? is the point oh, where we so didn't, like, we had already eaten. We didn't need to stop for anything. And this is the first moment where we deviated from how we normally ride because the whole point of this trip is to sort of putz around and, and see have the fun. state. Be, so be like we the bunnies. decided to. <laughs> If we ever see anything interesting, we will just divert toward it. We'll just stop. We'll poke at it. We don't have to get like every day is easier than the first day. And we realized that we felt great so far. Yeah. So we just stopped and we hung yeah. out for a while and we met this Scottish couple who were literally doing the exact same trip as us in reverse. They had started in Buffalo and they were on their like third to last day coming in the opposite direction of us. So this couple was like, I, you know, one of those things where I'm like, oh, I want to be like that because it's like they were older than us, but they had been doing touring for a long time. And it's definitely more of a thing in Europe. And they they gave us like tips about if you ever want to bike to Italy through the Dolomites and, yep. you know, and they did something kind of interesting since they were from overseas. They bought cheaper, like, you know, hybrids and then they wrote them all across the state and then they were going to donate them to charity. They figured for the cost of shipping a bike, you know, might as well pass the bike along to a kid in New York. And so I'm like, that's awesome. And uh, so, yeah, they they were just puttering along on their on their hybrids. And, you know, they they recognized us as fellow travelers and said, hey, you yep. know, what's going on? Though they, too, were like, yeah, that's a 14 day trip. You're you're insane. You too. <laughs> 
And uh, then after that, you know, we get through the forest and there's, we, we saw some cool stuff along the way. There was like this little wedding resort venue. And then well, we we've had- already passed a lot of the, in this area, as you get further up, like once you get yeah. past uh, Albany, this really isn't there anymore. Like this yeah. is not a thing, but in the entire bike trail, all the way up to Albany, there are a increasing number of breweries and farms Apple and like orchards. local businesses that know the bike trails there yeah. and know that bougie like cycling people from the cities often pass through this area and they have set up all sorts of stuff little tourism like uh, you know people from the city they even that far north i wish getting... we hadn't passed that uh whiskey distillery at like 10 15 in the morning <laughs> yeah. i i'm sorry when i've got a, a 70 mile day ahead of me i'm kind of like oh, i'm not sure i'm ready for a whiskey tasting yep but, i did stick to I, the... I didn't drink any alcohol during the day on any of these trips and that was that, that worked was out wise. pretty well. That was wise. But like there was signs being like, come to our farm, meet our goats. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you know, if I didn't have places to be, I would for sure go to your farm but and meet your goats. But if day one was, it's, an, it's a nice paved asphalt trail the entire way. Like that's a particular kind of cycling. Day two was the most varied because we started off on that same kind of trail. Then we went through the like gravelly woods and all these other things. And then we go through all these little towns where each town has implemented the trailway a different way. So yeah. there's just these little bike paths of varying quality and dimensions. Just it'll go through a town and kind of wind through alleys and stuff and then leave the town and be back on the on a road for a while. And yeah. we saw all these little towns. I couldn't remember the name of any of them along the way. And it was just really easy chill riding and we passed a variety of places like it was it was really interesting to see all these different types of i don't know to for lack of a better word places along the way there was a lot of road riding but it was very sedate road riding very picturesque you know small hills little like rolling waves of hills and you know i wasn't bothered at all traffic was fine except the horrible bridge yeah, so the- 199, 199 the, the Kingston Rhinecliff Bridge, because the route we take, it goes over the Hudson uh, and then it comes back over the Hudson and then it'll go over the Hudson again when you get up near Albany. Yeah. So you basically cross the Hudson multiple times. So this is a bridge across the Hudson. The Scottish couple warned us and said, oh, that bridge was awful. And I was like, how bad could it be? I go across bridges all the time. So this one, it doesn't have a separated bike path. The separated bike path is absolutely garbage and under construction and would be horrible to go And it on. has extreme, it's only a two lane bridge uh, with extreme car traffic going over it's it. It's very busy. You are right up next to, you're just praying that somebody is paying attention and isn't going to swerve into the bike path because there is nothing between you and them. It's also extremely high, extremely exposed and uh, shockingly windy. <laughs> So my advice and how I got over that bridge without have a freak without having a freaking panic attack was basically I just kept my vision keep on, on the swimming, line. Keep well, on just swimming, looked just at keep the, swimming. the perspective point where my lane diverges or my lane like converges into a point in the distance and just be like keep those white lines in your vision. You just stay within those white lines and you'll probably be fine. So, I got to say though on the downhill cuz you know I'm a I was a mountain biker yeah. for a long time so I got my bike up to j- about 50 miles an hour on the downhill. Yeah, I took it at a reasonable <laughs> pace. <laughs> you know, I break on downhills, he doesn't cuz he's a nut. Yeah, but but that was fun and basically after we crossed that then on the other side of the river we had to go through a college. You know, I think it was Bard College? Yep. And uh, that was really nice. And we talked a lot about how we wish communities were more like colleges and universities and like the idea of campus and everything being walkable and stuff. We were feeling very kindly disposed toward, uh, you know, walking and biking and public transportation and very like unhappy at cars for obvious reasons. Yep. But luckily, the, the like, like the, 
the trail is interesting yeah. because at a few points, like it follows the road for a little while, like when it's convenient, but then it just diverges off and cuts through this college campus and goes around back and through the woods and then links up to a different road further on. We ran into a guy who told us he had a bread and breakfast and that we should stay there next yep. time. Another and- uh, another instance <laughs> where he, uh, it was funny. He's like, you'll never forget the name. And you know what? I will never forget the name. The Siminski Inski. It looks nice. I went to the website, but we didn't stay there because we had already made reservations. Yep. But- but he was also disappointed because he was cool. Like he was riding his bike and he had, you know, a bunch of gear on it. He, yeah. could, he, this is a person who cycles the way we were cycling to get around, like to yeah. get between destinations in his day to day life. Yeah. Which if you live anywhere along this trail actually would work out pretty well. Mm-hmm. This is really easy to bike on. But he was like, oh yeah, you should stay at my place. Like the place, like it's, it's right there. And I think he was disappointed that we were going 60 miles that day and we were not anywhere <laughs> no, we were near not our gonna stopping stop. point. Yeah, we were about halfway. And uh, yeah, and then we got near Hudson. You know, it was more of the same until we got right near Hudson and then more road riding, riding in the shoulder. Well, that was also where roads. most of our elevation gain was. It was at the end. It's a big uphill to come into Hudson. We, we see this traffic light at the top of what feels like a mountain. Yeah, You know, we're just like, I see this intersection up ahead. I'm like, that's got to be the town we're you stopping were, You in. were out of steam and by that I point. was just like, oh, fuck. You know? And just pedaling up this hill. I'm like... I feel like I'm, my knee's going to quit on me. I feel like I'm going to fall over. Maybe a card's going to hit me. I don't know. But I made it up the hill and I was fine. So I was I was pretty running on fumes by the time I got into Hudson. But once we were there, it's such a darling little town. And it just feels like the kind of place that is, feels very posh. And well, it's, it's one of those towns where people from the city drive yes. up or take them train up every, for a weekend and stay at a bed and breakfast. Historic architecture founded by Quakers, but with a lot of little, little coffee shops and small plates and what have you. Um, I, I was happy to see a lot of like pro LGBT stuff, like places would have a rainbow flag in their window. And I was like, yeah, upstate, you know, it's, it's still got it's still got cool yep. people. So we settled in. We had a fantastic dinner at this really fancy French restaurant in this yeah. little outdoor terrace area. We, we showered I can see in the first. picture. I, you know what I drank? I had an Aperol spritz. <laughs> we, we showered first. That was the key thing. We check into our little uh, bed and breakfast kind of, I guess it wasn't a bed and breakfast, little hotel. It was a bed and breakfast. We just didn't avail ourselves of the food. Yeah. It's, it's one of those places that has an attached restaurant. Yeah. And we could have eaten there, but we ate at the other fancy looking place in their little like backyard terrace garden yeah. instead. So so we ate outside. We we ate in the garden of this French restaurant. It was excellent food. I think probably it was the best food, like the best prepared That was food. definitely the best meal we had yeah. on the entire trip. You know, it was like we got mushrooms on toast and I got really good fish and you know, so that was very tasty and the room was amazing. Um well, it was one of those like bougie little like rent this on Airbnb. They give nice. you a code that you uh, go like you key in to get into your little room. Yeah. There isn't really room service, and it was nice. And like we did every night, we took everything out of our bags, cleaned everything, kind of like put it back together. And so it's like we unpacked and then repacked. So it was it it felt very nice to kind of get everything together and to shower and get all clean, and it felt great. Yeah. Now, it's funny because this is the point, like sort of the next coming into this day three is where I had the most trepidation of the entire trip because this was when it was real. This was like, it's not just, oh, we did two days in a row. Like we can do this. It's now we are three full days into a seven day trip. Are we still going to be able to bike? Because we have to bike 10 more miles on day three than we did on the previous day. We yeah. had to make it 69 miles to Schenectady. So we were going to go the rest of the way north, hit Albany, yeah. and then make a left turn and come around onto the actual Erie Canal. So yeah. this this day three was when it really felt real. And I got to say, by the end of day three, we still felt great. Like yeah. we were fine. <laughs> it, was, it was actually... well. Day three presented its challenges, but that was also a quite varied day. So we started off and the weather was great. And in in Hudson again, there was this little coffee shop that had, it was like coffee shop and motorcycle 
equipment. And I sent a picture to my sister, like, check this out, you know? Yeah. So, uh, and then, uh, we got co- cornered by a, uh, a rich woman and her dog who wanted to talk to she the was nice. She, she was, was definitely was- like, she wanted to talk about politics, but she was like liberal, you know, like the liberal white lady. She was like, well, I come from Quakers and this <laughs> is my dog. And it was a very cute dog. And so we, you know, chatted over coffee with this rando and uh, that was that was pleasant. And there's like a certain <laughs> species of rich person who live in these kinds of upstate New York towns. And I think most of their socializing is with whatever other people like passed through the town and visited yeah. the town. It definitely felt like that. It was for perfectly fine yeah. breakfast. It's kind of one of those people like you run into the same species at like, you know, ski resorts and stuff like that. <laughs> taking taking the boat out for a spin. <laughs> yeah. But, Anyway, but this, she was but nice. the morning on the way out, this yeah. is where I checked the weather because we had planned for a little bit of buffer day and everything, and the weather looked okay. But I see the first inklings that there is a major storm system developing yeah. west of us. So we're on. We go along this uh, this country trail, you know, through some kind of rural. So right along the high tension power lines, and I guess that's where they decided yep. to put the trail until we hit Erie. This is where so. the trail, like after we 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 do th- go through a few back alleys and a few like literally the parking lots behind effectively strip malls for a little bit, and eventually we get on the stone dust that they kept telling us about on the trailway, and. From this point on, I would say 60, 70 percent of the riding was on just stone dust in the wilderness, either next to train tracks, next to a river, next to a creek or under some power lines. Yep. And so, you know, you put you put bike paths next to infrastructure. It makes sense. Just how infrastructure pops up next to natural formations. You know, there's already a pathway cut in the mountain, you know, might as well have multiple kind of things going through it. Yep. So I ignored so, the weather thing because it didn't look like it would hit us or if it did, it would be near the end of the day. So that was a, time, that was a later in the day problem. And we the, just keep plugging until we actually get up. It kind of snuck up on us. Like before we knew it, we're in Albany because the way we planned the, the trip. You see the skyline. You come we over that ridge. The original plan, if we did it in six days, was to stop in Albany. but instead. Albany was just like something we passed through. We didn't even stop. We just went up and through <laughs> Albany and all the way to Schenectady. Yeah. So, you know, we, we come and we see the egg and, and which is like, I think it's the theater or something, but I'm like, look, it's Albany yep. on the horizon. And I got to say, it was a weird feeling to get to Albany and to one, know that we got there entirely by biking on a contiguous bike path that goes all the way to our apartment <laughs> in New York. And two, that, We'd done it entirely on our own up to this point, and we're not even stopping. Like we're not. This isn't even our destination. We're just passing through. So we did, we did take a little break in Albany in like a park by by the highway. Well, there's a rest stop. Yeah. that is also like a learning center and a part of the infrastructure that is like along the bike path because the bike path goes in a few other directions. Like this is a nexus of a bunch of different bike routes in New York State. Uh, we were just on one of them, so. In the middle of this bike path, we, there, along the road, there's a car rest stop that we just stopped at. We were the only ones there. Yep. And so it was uh, it was nice. And so we got through. I learned about sturgeon from like tourist plaques. Be like, learn about the Mohawk River and the Hudson and, you know, about our waterways in New York State. That's something that we learned a lot about is waterways. You it know? really <laughs> wasn't anywhere easy to stop to get food, though. So we yeah. kind of just no, decided kept going, to, kept to going. power through. Because the bi- interesting enough, the bike path through Albany compared to some of the other cities we biked through was very segregated from the city. Like it was either right on the river or like in its own dedicated area they had clearly built and fenced off from everything. Yeah. And this was a, an interesting one because this was around where we started to turn to go West Yep. Up, up well, you hit a very point, specific point north. where you have this great photo where you hit the point where the bike path diverges because most of the people we passed up to this point, other than the Scottish couple, they weren't going the way we were going. They were coming to and from Montreal. Yeah. So the cool part, when the bike trail splits off, it has signs just like the New York State Thruway does. And it's like, turn here to go west, turn here to go north. And they look yeah. like freeway signs. We stopped and took our cute little picture. Yeah, be like, this is the fork. And, uh, you know, we passed some some interesting things along the way, like uh, uh, where they make the nuclear reactors. We saw a thing that was like Department of Energy, 
nukes? Yep. Question mark. We both, sure we enough, both it was have a, the atomic power lab. Both of us independently had our. This feels like a <laughs> secure with a capital S. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're biking along the thing and be like, it was like no trespassing by order of government, and I'm like, yeah, there's. There's visible material <laughs> being contained within. Yep. And uh, so anyway. Well, think about how long we were next to that thing because it was yeah, such it was, a And big... the G, there was like the G factory too. So yeah. Lots of lots of big stuff like that. But anyway. But where the so, trail diverges, the, the, the north part like toward Montreal kind of just followed the road and like went off on its own way. But where we were going basically takes a hard left and into the woods. The forest time. And this is when it started to rain. Yep. And I was going up, I remember going up the hill and there had been a fair amount of climbing and I was starting to get a little bit beat. My legs were starting to get sore. We were tired. And we this were was... tired. And, you know, so we're like, okay, where do we go? And then it says detour. And I'm like, oh, come on. I don't want to go on a detour. I'm tired. I mean, Let's we've, bi- we've biked it. over 200 miles at this point. Yeah. And yeah, we, and it's raining. Yeah, Not it's, raining hard yet, but yeah, it is it's raining. It's drizzling. And so we're starting to get into the woods. And we look at this detour sign and we're like, like you know what? Oh, whatever. How bad could it be? <laughs> I look at the map. I'm like, there's no rivers over there. It's not like it's going to be impassable. Let's just fucking do it. And guess what? It is destroyed. <laughs> it's mud everywhere. And, you know, just big pieces of pavement just sticking up. And this is where I'm very glad I didn't have a road bike because we're just kind of picking our way down this nasty, muddy, wet, wet slope. And this and is then- also where we the, the, we encountered a few more cycling tourists along the way or uh, like doing yeah. their thing. But a lot of them would talk about how they would skip segments of the trail yeah. and like t- go off onto the road instead of following yeah. the trail because the road was more direct. But... Honestly, F that. And it riding on the trail is time. way more pleasant and yeah. way more comfortable. So so despite the fact that our detour was totally justified, I'm kind of glad we didn't take the detour because then we just stayed in the woods. We saw lots of little rabbits. Oh, that's right. It was stupid season because it was getting toward fall, which means that all the chipmunks and squirrels are very busy. Yeah. And they run around everywhere, back and forth. Little across chipmunks the road. running out in front of the bike. And constantly. so we basically had a thing where we call it the little guy patrol. And like whoever's in front would kind of be like, I see a chipmunk by the side of the trail. And so you'd have to, just like when you see deer and you're driving a car, you're just like, I'm watching you to make sure that you don't run in front of me. Yeah. And uh, so we saw bunnies. We saw deer. It was we saw great. a lot of rabbits <laughs> on this trip. We averaged yeah. multiple rabbits per day. Yeah, it was, and I think only the last day was the day we didn't see even one rabbit. No, we did. It was yeah, in we my did. granddad's house. Yes, at the very, <laughs> it, hanging out in the. I got a picture of it. <laughs> Literally in the driveway of my granddad's house. But so, the other part of this is right where we turn left and go off into yeah. the woods for this segment we're describing. Just as it starts to rain, there is nowhere to stop. There is no shelter. There are no waypoints. There isn't even really a way to get back to civilization. Like There's you're a just... bench once in a while, yep. I guess. So it starts raining harder and harder <laughs> and harder. <laughs> then... And we stop at one point. We're like, should we stop and take a break? And we realize there's literally no point. This is the because only way it's out is through, get, man. We're not going to get less wet. We're not going to get warmer. Every was, second we stay outside, we're just getting colder. We are soaked. We can't even use our phones for navigation anymore because it's our fingers are so wet and cold. So it was it was ridiculous. Like I started laughing because it was so like so much water. We stopped <laughs> so at one point water. and we sat on a bench with rain pouring down on us, eating snacks wet because it's the best <laughs> we can do and we need energy to push through the end. By the time we get near our waypoint for the night, it is raining so hard, like I can't even see. I had to take off my glasses. I took off my glasses earlier. And we couldn't find the hotel. Like I wasn't sure. There was, there was a bunch of hotels in this cluster, like off the freeway. And I couldn't tell which quadrant the hotel was in, nor could I use my phone because of the wet and rain. So we like take our bikes under this like freeway overpass and we're huddled in the rain in the mud, and yeah. I am like trying to dry my phone up enough and like unwrinkle my finger enough to do anything with it to find our hotel. And we finally figure it out and we bike through the mud behind the hotel and we get there and thank fucking Satan. This hotel has uh washers and dryers and it's, yep. we have this gigantic suite 
because no one it stays in like, a whole like tell like this. It was basically like this residence in yeah, type thing. A, bi- a long term business trip type of hotel. So it's like where they put like, you know, some somebody who works at GE and they've got to stay for like a month or something. And so it had a little kitchenette. It had like a big bathroom and ensuite kind of thing. And uh, yeah, they had a washer and dryer. Um, the dryer, actually, we got lucky with the chamois because it was basically like they had a setting with no heat yep. and it was just air dry. Because at this point we were, we had like, I had one more chamois I think I could wear and like we were it in is, a dire- It was already like we were, we were down to our, our last laundries. Yep. So. Uh, so we get in town, we shower. That was, I think- that was the first moment where I had to, we realized like, oh, there are difficulties we this will is, face. This is going to be badass because up till this point, yeah, of course, like going into Hudson, I was tired. I'm like, oh, I have to go up this big hill. But this was the first adversity, I guess. Yep. I mean, it wasn't bad adversity. And actually, oh, it, was super it was really fun. We were just pretty. laughing and, the whole way. Yeah, <laughs> it was like we were soaked to the bone and cold, but we were like, ha ha, it's so wet in the forest. And look at that chipmunk. And nothing then, that can happen to us is dangerous here. Yeah. It is just uncomfortable Mildly in that unpleasant. I am traveling through <laughs> adversity. Way. And there's there's no way to get out of the rain. But then we did get out of the rain and washed our clothes. And this was actually, I'd say that was one of the top 10 showers of my life. <laughs> that was the first time, too, that I had uh, gone done indoor dining because there it was impossible yeah. to do outdoor dining and we just this was the first indoor other. dining on the trip this was one of the first indoor dinings we'd done since, since 2020 quarantine. yeah so connected to the hotel was if you don't live in new york you you might not know exactly what we're talking about this is like a New York Italian it's steakhouse very Italian. shop shop yeah the so kind of place that has like Cheap Italian seafood, moderately priced Italian like steaks and pasta and stuff on the walls and meh cocktails and all the wine and, you can and drink. And those little lamps that are made of colored glass. And yep. it's basically the kind of place you could get spaghetti as a side dish. Like imagine a place that looks kind of like what a TGI Fridays would look like, except it's all kind of done earnestly. It's not a chain that yeah. like bought a kit to make a TGI Fridays. There, and the food is like really hearty, more than you can eat, like yeah. Americana Italian. I freaking cleaned my plate. It's very I ate similar. all the bread. I ate all the salad. I ate all the you pasta. Know, if, you, if you're listening to this from like the Midwest, you know what it's like? It's kind of like a Mountain Jack Steakhouse. Like the kind of place that your parents would have taken you after the high school band awards night or the kind of place you would go to like to celebrate a graduation. Yeah. Like I get that. There was a place very similar to that in my town called LB grand. It went out of business during the pandemic. I was kind of bummed. Yeah. But like, again, you know, I got this hearty seafood pasta. Oh my God. We went in there and and we were ravenous. And I'm sure it wasn't the fan. Like I said, the French place was probably Finer this dining. was the second best meal of the whole trip. But it was, I was so hungry and it tasted so good. There is no better spice than hunger. You know, ride for three days on your bicycle. And I think we've know, been running at a caloric was, deficit because of the fancy dining heaven. the night before. We ate that food like we were goblins who had never been in a restaurant before. And then we staggered full <laughs> of food and drink to the hotel and basically instantly fell asleep. <laughs> It was lovely. But uh, right before we went to bed, I was, I was checking the next day, and this is where we ran into our first actual trouble. So right before bed, I look at the weather, and there are extreme thunderstorm warnings for the following day. Like, not, oh, it's going to rain and it might lightning, but like shelter-in-place warnings. It was very dun-dun-dun, to-be-continued cliffhanger, but the kind of cliffhanger that comes from the Weather Channel. Yep. So So from this point on, in the next morning, we actually had to deviate our plan significantly. So originally at the start of day four, we needed to go 80 miles. So the original plan was we have a 100-mile day, then we have like a 70-mile day, then a 60-mile day. And then an 80 mile day. So big day, small day, small day, big day, small day, small day, big day was kind of the original plan. Yeah. So the next morning we wake up because we decided to not worry about the storm until the morning and then decide what to do. You know, grab a couple of Red Bulls and and stand out on the balcony and, and Especially figure it out. Especially because we were in a place we could just stay here if we needed to. Like if yeah. we had to just burn a day. We could just stay in this nice place. 
Uh, and we wake up, and the weather looks beautiful. It's, it's just, just sunny, misty, and warm, and perfect. And we're sitting on our little balcony, we're and like the sun is just rising. Right over the Mohawk River, I want to say. We're right on some sort of waterway. And, you know, we come out on the balcony, and the sun's shining down on us. But we're still checking the weather, and it's still looking really Well, I checked really the weather, and it's, it's not even looking anymore. It is like, it's all right, gonna hit. here is a storm. And the hard part is, it is easy to think about the weather when you're in one place, but when you're traveling, and especially, remember, we are traveling in the opposite direction for how most people do this trip, because most people we learned on the road start in Buffalo and come across to New York City. That way, they're following the prevailing winds. So, and they're fought, like they're basically doing mostly downhill. Like it's a very different type of route. Yeah. So we had to do a lot of uphill to get started instead of at the end of our trip having a lot of downhill. But two, we had to go against the wind the entire time and weather would be coming toward us. Yeah. So, so I you'd calculate see clouds. and I figure out that if we continue on our path, the tornadoes and extreme dangerous weather would hit us about a 40 miles into our travel and looking at the map, there is nothing. There is nowhere safe to stop around 30 to 50 miles out. So, imagine, so there's no way to go. Like it would, we would have been stuck like we had been the previous night, except it would have been tornadoes and dangerous wind and lightning instead of just like, rain. Hurricane like conditions, basically there. It was to the point where on my iPhone, there was warnings popping up and being yep. like a heavy weather alert kind of thing. So if so, you ever do a trip like this one, like I cannot stress this enough. No matter what the weather forecast was, you check the weather every time you stop and continuously recalibrate based on that. And if you feel uncomfortable with something, you're probably right. I would play it safe in the absent. Like, yeah, the worst that can happen is you end up staying too long in a town and it doesn't end up raining that hard. Yep. But oh no, that's you're better in a than town. dying. <laughs> so. like, and also, you know, if you're in a place that has stuff to do, like we were in a town where there was stuff, so it wouldn't have been the end of yeah. the world. I mean, even if we had to stay in our hotel room the whole time and just look at our phones and watch TV. We had that TV. gigantic like three room suite, so <laughs> it would have been fine. Anyway. So we uh, we get up and I see this. So we have breakfast and coffee in the room while I do the logistics. Yeah. And basically we made the call to burn one of our buffer days, but... It seemed like we could make it 20 to 30 miles down the road without diff like before it hit no matter what. We could make we could make it 40 if we pushed it, but that seemed like a risk. So, uh I dug around and there's a town called Amsterdam that was about 20 miles down the road. And it was mentioned by the Scottish couple. They yep. mentioned they said something about there's this town where you can stay in a castle. And we're like, oh, man, you know, Scotland, you've got all sorts of castles. You yep. know? So we we're just chatting and they they had brought this up. And we're like, Amsterdam, isn't that where the, you know, armory and slash I look it up in Google Maps. Thing? You look at this town in Google Maps and the first thing you see in any image is what looks like a giant castle. Yeah. So basically, this town is tiny. This town is kind of split into two by the river. But it's this podunk little town. But it had an armory that was like in use until... Fairly recently. Yep. And there's a know? whole story where like a family bought it and tried to turn it into a, a bed and breakfast or a family residence and that failed and then a different family bought it. And now it is a bed and breakfast and residence. And wedding venue and, you know, basically a big tourist draw of this town. One of the only tourist draws of this town is there is a castle there. So, so we I, decided so, to go there. So we decide rather than doing a no travel day, Getting 20 miles down the road, even though we're burning one of our buffer days, it means we have 20 fewer miles to do at the end in case we run into some other trouble. Because, you know, we don't know. In hindsight, we know nothing went wrong, but you never know if something else would go wrong. So we decide to get as far down the road as we safely can. And Amsterdam is the only waypoint we could reasonably reach. So it made perfect sense. So I call this castle and they are totally like they have an open room. It's cheap. <laughs> it's like a hundred bucks a night. So we just decided to stay there and made a reservation and thankfully almost every other place we were staying because i booked all the hotels in advance for the whole trip all the other hotels down the road with like one exception one or two exceptions were best westerns 
They don't care. Best Westerns. The, I call them all like, hey, can I push the reservation back a day? And they're like, whatever. They would literally no skin off their back. So we rearranged everything. We recalibrated the trip and we decided to go to Amsterdam on this day, just 20 miles. And then the next day, rather than recalibrating the rest of the trip, we just went 65 miles to Utica instead of 85 miles to Utica. Yeah, so the Utica Best Western, we just said, can we move our reservation? They were like, yeah, sure, we got open rooms. Yep. That's fine. So, so meanwhile, you know, we're chatting with our friends on Discord, like, because we got this whole morning to kill. We only have 20 miles to ride. 20 miles is like, like I wouldn't even bring a water bottle if I was <laughs> yeah. biking 20 miles It's, it's in our like a, life. something we do in the city. That's like going to the west side and back, basically. So 20 miles is like, in terms of the actual biking part of the day, it's like, you know, just so totally cakewalk. And we get to the castle. Obviously, they're very custom to cyclists. They have this whole procedure like, oh, yeah, we'll take you in the back. Yep, and they got a heated garage. Oh, it was great. But the worst part was getting to Amsterdam. It's be- still beautiful weather. There is no indication whatsoever. Sunny and misty. And we're kind of like, oh, man, we pass we all these quarries and we, we were on the Erie Canal for a big segment. And it's just beautiful. But when we roll into Amsterdam the and we talk to the locals, are looming. everyone in town mentions out of no, like without us prompting them, like, oh, yeah, that storm's coming. Storm we're, coming. Well, we were going to si- be a big blow tonight. Well, we were sitting uh, in uh, this place eating a hot dog because there's nothing open. <laughs> Everything Amsterdam. was closed. It was Sunday, I want to say. No, it was Monday. No, it was but- Monday. Yeah. So we're in the town and auto, I overhear someone on their phone and they are literally like telling their contractor, yo, you have got to bring all the tarps and cover the roof now. We've got an hour before like the storm of the century rolls through. Yeah. Like the whole town is like a buzz with talk of yeah. the storm. So we're, we're chowing down on our hot dogs. And, but we and knew making, well, we knew coming uh, into Amsterdam, talking to our friends because we have friends who live upstate. And we mentioned like, oh, hey, we're going to stay in this castle in Amsterdam. And they're really into the castle. But multiple people warn us, quoting directly from the chat log, uh, nothing is open on Mondays in Amsterdam. Yeah. That town for whatever. Monday is the day nothing is open in that town. Well, I mean, restaurants, restaurants, even in in LIC and in New York, is there everybody has to have a rest day. But restaurants do a lot of business. But this whole town shuts down on Mondays because weekends are when all the weddings happen and all the people come to this town to do a thing. Yeah. So even the hotel we're staying in, when we check in, they're like really apologetic because they have this beautiful, like it's hard to describe unless you see a a picture of it. It looks like a feasting hall from a stereotype of a medieval castle. Yeah. It's got suits of armor everywhere and everything is gilded. And they're like, we're so sorry, but the ho- the kitchen is not open on Mondays in the hotel. There were two places in the entire town we could eat unless we were willing to go over the river to like this far away other part of town where there was some fast food. But we didn't want to go over there because the storm was coming in. We didn't want to get stuck. Yeah. And plus our friends were like, eh, Amsterdam, it's like dodgy and you won't find anything particularly inspiring. Yep. But the so, castle was beautiful. It was super cool. There were all these old furniture. It looked like something from the 1930s or even like the turn of the century. And there were like a, a, a organ and it just it's a super interesting place and like hella cheap for what it was. I think that was probably, you know how I talk about like, oh, that was the best meal. That was the coolest thing. This was probably the most unique lodging we went. Like this was, it wasn't necessarily the the fanciest. The place in Syracuse was the second most unique though when we get to that day. Yeah, but this was definitely like pretty cool in terms of something we kind of decided on the spur of the moment and it really added to the memories of this trip. And so we we finish our, our lunch and then we get we, we went to the gas station to pick up a bunch of crunchy snacks. The gas snacks. station was so dodgy. <laughs> it, like, was, it was an incredibly small you town know those by gas a highway gas station. Like, half the stuff on the shelves is actually <laughs> Probably expired. expired yeah. Like I was ch- like I was rooting through to find like the unexpired peanuts. <laughs> well, anyway, we picked up a ton of stuff at the gas station. I got some like sweet Chex Mix and a bunch of other junk. And so we were just like we were all kitted out for the rest of the rest of the ride. And uh, so we took our our hall back to their our little room, 
and just kind of hunkered down. And sure yep. enough, it starts to blow and it starts to rain. Now, one, one thing that we didn't do on this trip is we didn't bring any technology. The all We didn't bring books or entertainment. All we had were our two cell phones. I, like, almost, I almost brought my laptop because, I again, I work in gaming and like this project was going on in terms of, uh, you know, crunch time for a while. And so I was like, Oh, I should really be like checking in with work. But Rim was like, don't bring your laptop. And I am yep. so glad I did not bring my laptop. Cause one, I would have been worried about hurting it. And two, I'm glad I just decided to like fuck off from work for a week. It yeah. was one of the most meaningful trips I've ever been on. So it was like, you and know, it was just, more fun to just hang out than like, just, like I'd check in on work stuff yeah. or anything. Oh, I did do one meeting while we were in this hotel room. Yep. I checked in and I had my Monday meeting with my boss and with some of the other art team about our animation pipeline. And so I was sitting in a chair for about 45 minutes just chatting about motion capture and stuff like that. They, they were a little torqued with me for taking time off, but you know. I don't regret it. <laughs> yep, but my minor regret is what I should have brought, and I realized it on the trip, and if we do this again, I will, is a, a, just a lightning to HDMI adapter so you could stream stuff from the phone because we could have watched some Star Trek a little bit or hung out in the evening. Yeah. It wasn't really worth it to watch stuff on the phone, uh, especially if you might get stuck in a town for an entire day on a trip like this, Yeah. So especially if you take you know two weeks to do it instead of one week. So at night, there's nowhere to eat. There's nowhere to get food. <laughs> There is one pizza joint. So I put in an order for a pizza and I have to go pick it up. They won't even deliver. And this pizza joint is also like the only bar in town. And as far as I can tell, the entire town is in this bar drinking <laughs> and having pizza. And there's that guy trying to sell somebody on a Bitcoin well, you know the kind or of scene something in a movie where like someone who's not from there walks into like the town, whatever, and everyone gets quiet Everyone gets quiet for a second when I walk in and they all start talking to each other again. And then it's like, ah, Joey Jojo is trying to sell me on his multi-level marketing something. Oh my something. God, <laughs> this like local <laughs> influencer guy who like swears he's big and like has a podcast is trying to sweet talk the bartender into like doing some sort of business deal with him. And the bartender like he got no time basically for that. <laughs> makes a beeline over to me to He's get like, away from this. Would dude. you like pizza? <laughs> I can get you pizza. And he I like sat beer. with me to get away from this guy and was really, really sad that I was leaving with the pizza rather than staying and, <laughs> and providing this guy. social cover. <laughs> But yeah, so I, I stayed back in the room. I was just kind of, you know, feeling feeling nice and calm and a little bit toasty. And <laughs> so I, I decided to wait for the pizza. And uh, yeah, we, we came back. And the thing about doing this with your partner is you spend a lot of alone time together. And it's a really good bonding time. It's like not even like you're talking constantly on the road. But there's something about just either riding together in silence or just like sitting next to each other, poking at your phones where like you're together, you know? So like riding in tandem is, is, is something really nice. Anyway, that was kind of what the day was. It's just spending a lazy day together with just our phones for entertainment and just chatting. Yeah, it was a nice time. But it was funny. Is you'd think like, oh, we'd be tired, and we were like really looking forward to a rest day. I was kind of just antsy to get back on the road too. Like, yeah. it felt weird. To <laughs> we didn't bike, get tired out from twenty miles, so to bike we already such had. a short distance <laughs> felt weird until the storm rolled in, and the storm was fucking nuts. It, like, it was definitely. I I wouldn't like. You know, I was complaining about, oh, it rained so much on the way to Schenectady. That was just a rainstorm. <laughs> This was like legit tornadoes, the worst part was, knock trees over and stuff. While, so, we, while we were mooching around in town, we, we met some other cyclists yeah. and we thought a restaurant was open because they were eating outside the yeah. restaurant. But no, the restaurant was closed. They just stopped there. Oh, they, they were, were the camping, camping type. They were the, because like I said, we're, we did it the bougie way. We did it the way where we were like, oh, we'll Not stay. really bougie. At Best Western's like oh, 110 well, yeah, bucks. But like, okay, compared to people who do, what is it? Gravel packing? Yeah. Compared to gravel packing people, it's, 
it is like we were the height of luxury, you know? We stayed on a like a mattress every night. But these folks, they had their their tent and their camping equipment, and we were like, storms coming. They were like, we yeah, know. Yeah, but <laughs> you know? They, they weren't sure where they were yeah. going to shelter, and they were trying to figure out like how far to go down the road so, because I knew the direction they were going, there is nowhere to stop. Well... I don't know what happened to them, but I wish them luck. And I really, you know, they started out and it was kind of like, well, good luck. I hope, good, you know, safe travels kind of thing. Yeah. So it was good. It was really, uh, you know, <laughs> I went goblin mode on my snacks. And I, I think this was kind of a blessing in disguise because we got to stay at the cool castle and also our butts recovered, our legs recovered, all our sore muscles. We took that ibuprofen and we got that CBD and we felt a lot better. Yep. Now we I were replenished. We definitely didn't need a rest day. We didn't need it, but I, I sure in hell enjoyed it. And this is where <laughs> sort of planning a trip like this again, the only thing I would really change is we would not go all the way to Poughkeepsie day one. Not so much because 100 miles the first day sucks. Actually, 100 miles the first day was really refreshing because you get so many of the it's, miles out of the way. It's doing the hardest part up front, or at least like the most substantial part up front. It feels like, you know, like you checked your biggest task off the yep. to-do list. But I you think know? instead I would recalibrate to spend the first night, like do an easier ride. And do stop like, like Terrytown or, or yeah. And then that way, when you come around Albany, either stay in Albany or stay in Amsterdam, but not have to do like we wouldn't have to do what was going to be the 85 mile stretch yeah. to Utica from Schenectady that we'd originally planned. Yeah. That is probably the most desolate stretch in the entire trip. Yeah. That area. Uh, Utica, uh, Amsterdam to Utica. Yeah. Yeah. That was that day. So we woke up and it was so, cold yeah. and rainy. So day five, we wake up day and five. it's chilly. It's sprinkling off and on. It's a little bit windy. But even though we have to go 65 miles, uh, there's almost no elevation gain. It's basically just flat it's because now flat. we're upstate. And it's mostly either along highways on a separated path or along the Erie Canal. Yeah. So we just started going. So basically, once we turned west, we started to get away from like that kind of Catskill mountainous or even yep. like the way to Hudson where it was kind of like soft undulating hills. <laughs> Um, it's just it's, flat. It's very flat. The wind is coming at your face yeah, the like wind 90% never stops. of the time. So you got to be prepared to fight against the wind quite a bit. But, you know, it, it was definitely the day after a storm. Things were drizzly. It was overcast. And we were what along my, these my, stone uh, dust trails. I put on my one waterproof, like, warm shell yeah. uh, jersey instead of my regular bike jersey. You I was double that, layered. That yeah, I, I put I put my casual, like, I actually took one of my pieces of casual clothes and put it on over my jersey. So, you know, it definitely got chillier. And so we're we're biking. It's fairly easy biking, but it's yeah. it's and not super is, pleasant. This is what most of the trail is actually like. Yeah. In that you're just along the Erie Canal and you pass canal stuff and locks and yeah. like river navigating equipment and things. And there's not as many of those like bed and breakfast for fancy people yeah. from the city it coming up for a weekend. It definitely isn't a tourist attraction place. This is <laughs> this is agricultural areas industrial areas it's actually kind of cool because i feel like i saw so many of the different faces of my state i mean i'm born and raised in new york state but western new york and then i've been living in like the city for going yeah, on two decades that middle part of upstate so, i've pretty much only ever driven past flown over or ridden a train through yeah so basically this was seeing at least what is along what was originally new york's central like vein of commerce, it's artery where goods just traverse the state. Um, and so you saw factories, you saw locks, you saw just cornfields upon cornfields. And like we stopped for lunch. You looked up like, where's there a town yeah, this about is the, Midway? This, so this is the, the section of the map I made where there really are no places to stop. I had flagged two ice cream shops that we I knew were near the trail that cyclists tend to stop at because, eh, you know, when in doubt, 
Ice cream is actually a really good <laughs> meal on a cycling Unless trip. you're super lactose intolerant, which Bring some lactate and do it anyway. It is. Talk about calorie density <laughs> yeah, and also you refreshing. You got your fats, you got your sugars, you know, it's it's good. But so, we had to leave the trail and like bike off a ways into a town to get food. And we basically stopped in this town. Like we stopped at this giant Amish supermarket. Yeah. Kind of in the middle of nowhere. And it was, it was like... Full on Amish country, and there were people with head head hats, yeah. like those little bonnet things, and they rode around on scooters, like they had bikes, but the bikes you could push push with your feet. Yeah, yeah, that culture you can't have a bike with with pedals, yeah. but uh, women can use a little scooter, basically. Yeah, so women can use the scoot scoot, and we went there. and We got some really solid submarine sandwiches, and I must say. As somebody who grew up in Western New York, I am disappointed. Just like how pizza, I know this is sacrilege, as like somebody who considers myself a New Yorker now, I sometimes like the pizza and subs that I grew up in my Italian and Irish small town in Western yep. New York. Because well, because there's two <laughs> things going on there. With subs, New York City can't make a sub for its, yeah, to save itself. Yeah, what is that? That is, that is the one thing that New York City cannot do I, is get you a proper submarine sandwich. Philly can do it. Basically, yeah. all of Pennsylvania can do it. All of upstate New York what, can do it. All of Michigan hoagie, can do it. What you call a grinder, whatever. Ohio can make subs. It's, it's the... Italian style sandwich on a big long bread with possible sesame seeds or not. I still but think you could make it to Bella's in Manhattan <laughs> and like change everything. I think everything. you could make bank if you did a Bella's franchise in Manhattan. But honestly, it's like those were good sandwiches and we we just stopped at the Amish bar. I got some snacks. I got like wasabi peas and chips. Definitely upstate. I think we stuff. spent like $12 total on that meal that was Twice as big as we thought it was going to be, <laughs> and taking the free the soda was not optional. That was just part. It of was it. just take this Mountain Dew, or I guess ginger ale. It's like ginger ale time, and I was like, yeah, I could use the calories. That's the interesting thing about bike touring. Is like, okay, I must admit, part of the reason I every am time so I stopped, active. I was eating constantly until we started moving again, <laughs> and I was also eating pretty constantly rim, while we rim. were biking. As somebody who is like got a reputation for being a total cookie yeah. monster. Do you not, part of the reason, not the whole reason, like a minor reason you exercise so much, is it not so you can enjoy whatever oh, food why, you want to, even though running. we're like middle-aged? I started <laughs> doing like running cardio in college because literally I wanted to be able to eat garbage with no consequences. <laughs> That's it. It's basically like, I want to eat me Good and Ken food. had that whole path where we would get up in the morning every day and go and trudge the half mile through the cold to the gym and run in that freezing cold eighth mile like circumference track I mean, hanging in the ceiling of RIT's gym just so I could eat garbage all day. Yeah, but like so exercise is in a lot of ways like biking is its own reward, but I can't can't deny that eating all the cookies that doesn't hurt either. Nope. <laughs> like, so we were at the stage of our trip where eating all the cookies sounded like a really good idea. Oh, we li we would just eat <laughs> constantly. If we stopped, we'd get out the snacks and just, just be nom, constantly nom, nom. shoving Very, them into our faces. It was, it was like if somebody stopped by, it would look like Cookie Monster. Like it's these two goblins hunched on a park bench just like eating pretzels and potato chips and stuff. And this whole <laughs> day, the cadence, it was beautiful vistas yeah. like everywhere we went and we'd basically just every lots now of canal. and then lots of canal though it yep. was very flat but like this was the section of the canal where you really saw canal as infrastructure and it kind of made me be like oh yeah. i wish we still had that more. and the cadence of our trip was basically we're kind of cold and kind of wet and every now and then we'd the trail would like cut into a town and every town would have like a little monument sign that's like, here's something about what happened in this town. And there'd be a little gazebo and we would stop in the gazebos and we tried to time <laughs> squeeze it. Squeeze out our, our, cause it started raining pretty kind of like this to connected leg where it started really pouring after a while. Off and on, but we timed <laughs> it. Well, I'd say two thirds of the times the rain picked up, we were able to find shelter and wait it out and That's then start true. again when the rain stopped. Yeah, we kind of, we, we went like gazebo to gazebo <laughs> yeah. through these towns 
and we'd stop in the gazebo, wring out our clothes, eat some snacks. And then when the rain stopped, we just set back out. So we passed this big neon sign for Utica. And then right away, there was a little marina. We knew what we were looking for because of Google Maps. We're like, once we passed the marina, we knew we were basically at our exit. Yep. Right on to the Miracle Mile where this old 1970s looking Best Western was. Yep. Oh, my God. Utica is a hard place to stop in because the trail just goes past Utica. Yeah. But... All the hotels are quite a ways away from the trail on just regular ass streets with no sidewalks Except. that are not like really navigable. So we stayed at a Best Western that was just off the highway that as a result was sh- really close to the it trail. Was, it was like walkable, like yeah. literally walk 10 minutes from the marina that's right on the bu- on the canal. Yep. To this Best Western, it's just across the little bridge. We rode on the sidewalks because there were zero pedestrians, and yep. I wasn't going to ride. But on it would have been street. it, it was been, a strode. It would have been a challenge <laughs> to stay like in Utica at the nice hotels. Don't don't ride on the strode. The strode is terrifying. And this was I haven't stayed at a Best Western on purpose since like I was in high school. Oh so really? I didn't really think much about it. But I booked a bunch of these Best Westerns. This was the first one. Because they were the only hotels in town on a lot of the rest of the trip. Yeah. And I got to say, in retrospect, not only was that brilliant, but I will seek out Best Westerns on cycling trips. Because okay. unlike regular hotels, Best Westerns do not give a fuck if you have a bike. They will <laughs> leave you alone. Whatever you're up to is your business They're in just hotel. like, don't trash the room or poop in the hallway. You're good. You know, they, they're they very they're chill. Cheap, they're flexible. And every one of them has a washer and dryer laundromat, though. This is where, you know, America gets weird. So this Best Western has a washer and dryer that take quarters. There's no change machine. And when I go to the front desk, they don't have change. There is literally no way to get change. Literally no way. Oh, so like the nice no, lady the only helped way us. We were able to get change is that I was desperate and I kept I was asking guy, like, look, you gotta help us out. There's like we we gotta do laundry. Nice, we're on this bike. Nice trip. front desk housekeeper lady was like, Oh, I'll well, the front desk guy for- couldn't help us either. Oh, right, right. The house he called the housekeeper because she's the only other employee they have. And she happened to have a few dollars worth of quarters in her car that she was willing to trade to us. Yeah. And so we had this. I tell you. So if you go on a trip like this, bring like $20 worth of quarters and rolls because there is literally no way to get quarters in America unless you get really (laughs) lucky. We got really lucky. But I got to say. We were almost screwed. I got to say, Best Western, the thing is, it's got like this minimum viable standard of quality which is like, it's a budget hotel, but it's also really relaxed. It's everybody was really nice and it served our purpose like totally well. But you got to bring quarters. (laughs) I'm telling you, there is no way to get quarters anywhere in this country. So instead of putting our chamois in the dryer, I came up with a good solution how to dry them in the closet by the radiator. And we put our incredibly soaked shoes. Well, that was something we started doing every night. We put, we take the soles out of the SPDs and we'd just stick them on the radiator, like kind of balanced. And we put our, like our important socks and things in the area and we just dry everything out as best we could. And, Nothing got 100% dry. But it was close enough and it was, it avoided any problems with like, you know, chafing and stuff like that. Everything was nice and clean. Really just bring at least one more shiny than you're going to (laughs) need so that when you do laundry, the laundry you do on any given day doesn't need to be dry for the next day. Also, don't plan on having great weather because like I think half of the days on this trip, we got rained on to some extent, which was fine. Like I, we're, we're both hardy individuals. We were, you know, we kind of rolled with it, but like, I, roll with it was wasn't it kind of like my slogan i kept saying yeah ah, we'll roll with it and that came became like our cliche during the, the trip it's like i don't know yep. but we'll roll with it now there was fast food and stuff but we ended up doing the fanciest place we could find to eat nearby because we were again like hungry to the point of pain so we, we ate at the marina <laughs> and the marina had the same kind of food as the chop house i'm gonna say it wasn't is good. It was definitely overpriced, like okay food. It wasn't bad. It was where the old people go. It's in. that, you know, that kind of <laughs> restaurant where you only see old people eating at it. And it's like well to do old people, but I don't they think they go park their boat and then they have yep. a little glass of Chardonnay and some. But soup. it's the place that like every old person goes to hang out and it's fancy ish, but the food is good ish. Yeah. I 
liked it. So it was. I mean, I was desperate and would eat anything, and the food wasn't bad. Like, don't get again, me wrong. Again. The food was perfectly fine, <laughs> but the previous two days we had had fantastic we had been, food. We had been spoiled to some extent. Well, no, the previous day we had pizza and hot dogs, but I couldn't. Well, pizza was we, we had good, it, though, because that was an upstate. In, in a royal setting. I think if it's the only pizza joint in town, in a town like that, it's pretty good it pizza. Was, it was definitely. Uh, listen, everything mm. down to the Chex Mix I bought at the Dodgy da- gas station tasted like ambrosia. <laughs> I was in heaven putting food in my mouth. I was like, the subs from the Amish people, give me that food. I just didn't care, and I was happy to be there. Yep. So we made it, and it was a very nice day. And at this point, like after the end of this day, I remember we we moved on from our thinking of, this is going better than I expected, like everything's working out, to... Zero concerns like the rest of this trip is going to be so easy. Like we are locked in golden and we were right. Like this is when we got into our groove. Like we had a full rhythm. We had learned the minor like here's how like unpack everything, repack everything. We started to get into how how to organize our panniers (laughs) for like maximum efficiency. So, you know, where everything is located. I mean, like I'm the kind of person like in that movie, Amelie, where the whole thing about taking, dumping your purse, purse out and organizing it. And then, you know, putting it back in. That's how I felt like organizing a, anything from a messenger bag to my panniers. It's just kind of like, Oh, I'm going to like just catalog all my stuff and make sure it's all there. And it's put exactly right. And I think that it's not that we didn't encounter any adversity because obviously we just told you about the storm. That was a huge part of it. And we got rained on probably about like <laughs> at least a third of the time. So I uh, I do think we had, we had by this time kind of acc- acclimated. Yeah, you like know, at, at this point, honestly, <laughs> this is this is like, oh, now this is this is our routine. We wake up and we put our body we through hit the point its where paces and but for <laughs> hit the road, but and for <laughs> life and money and other circumstances, like we could do this for an indefinite amount of time, like that amount of rough mileage per day, with yeah. that amount of resting, and we could just go forever. Like yeah. the only thing stopping us was having lives to get back to at that point. So day six was another one of those perfect days. The weather was nice and we just had 63 miles to get to Syracuse with basically no elevation gain. And that was honestly, I think that might have been the easiest day. Maybe. Yeah, it was. It was the easiest day of full riding, at least around around 60 ish. uh, We we, you know, did our traditional see we we always have like caffeine in the morning and I, I know it's a stereotype, but like Red Bull gives you wings. Yeah. <laughs> so it was kind of like we stop and pound two Red Bulls at some gas station and just enjoy the sunlight. But this and- was the most consistent day. Like the weather was sunny. It was warm again. And the trail was basically just almost all of it was the same. It Follow was the canal. Just a little stone dust path. That went along the canal, and we passed so many bike tourists. Like, yeah, and we we passed just entire dozens groups. and dozens of people touring and doing the exact same trip we were doing, it, mostly we, in the opposite direction. Yeah, I think only one group passed us at any point in this trip, going the same direction we were going. I thought we ran into a fe- no. He was also going to New York. Yep. Okay, Everyone, never mind. <laughs> we we but we met a lot of people coming our way. Yeah, but no one passed us because we were going very fast, except. Way back a few days prior, there was a giant group of people who were heading north toward Montreal that we met uh, on the trip to Poughkeepsie. They were a lot faster than us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But that was the only one. Otherwise, like no one really passed us at any point. Yeah. But they were from from the Netherlands. I remember because yep. I was talking to them and their jerseys were like Modan, the artist. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. Anyway. Um, yeah, so Syracuse, it was kind of This rhythm was whatever. just bike for 45 minutes on a straight path through the woods next to the canal that's just picturesque, and then it crosses a road, and then do another 45 minutes of the exact same thing, and then there's a town, and then another hour of the exact same thing. Like, it was the most consistent day to the point that the whole day almost blurs together. Yeah, yeah. 
So that that one, like, I don't have a ton to say about. We saw a lot of little towns. We crossed some locks. We saw lots of turtles. There was like, we were like, get out of the road, turtle, and we'd scootle some this of them. This is also where we started passing a lot of aqueducts because the, the original Erie Canal and the renovated Erie Canal both had areas where they needed a river that would otherwise cross the canal to not intersect with the canal because otherwise the river would just become the canal and the other side of it would dry up. And so as we Or got- the canal would flood the other side of it. So we biked and walked our bikes over a lot of like really old infrastructure yeah. that still works. Yeah. And we also passed through a bunch of towns where the old we were following the old Erie Canal, which in many parts is just walled off. Yeah, or it goes like it's basically filled in, or there are some cases where it's just like a little mucky patch in the woods. Yeah. Like there's this little Thing covered with algae and it's like bright neon green and nobody would ever boat on it ever. Yep. But then other places it's like, you know, it's quite picturesque. So anyway, once we got nearer to Syracuse, it started to be paved again. It's not stone dust. And we could tell we were starting to get near a city. And what's cool is around Syracuse, there's this really awful strode there, but they built the the canal, like the bike path, this New York State Greenway, Greenway. Thing. They built it in the middle of this strode. So there's basically just like a two way bike lane between the two parts of the highway. And Didn't at least for say, cyclists, that's kind of how they do it in Europe. Some places yeah. or, you know, it's in like some places, like in yeah. Australia, it's just like where the shoulder would be. There's yeah. just a bike path or just yeah. bike in the shoulder, but the shoulder's nice. Yeah. So it's the, there's two ways. There's the bike on the side of the road, like the shoulder style. And in some places they actually have the shoulder, like uh, kind of near the North County Trailway yep. when, on that ride to Poughkeepsie. There's this area where you're going along the highway, but you're you're separated by like a media, like a, like a fence from the actual highway. And you're on like a glorified shoulder. And basically, once you get to near Syracuse area, you're the opposite. You're going in the middle between the two lanes of traffic. And I mean, like, it's more than two lanes. It's like one of those god awful suburban roads yeah. that where, you know, the Miracle Mile, where all the like the Kmart and like there was actually there was a lot of like delicious looking Chinese food and stuff along the way. And I was kind of like, hmm, Szechuan food. But, uh, you know, we did stop in that outside of town. We had to make it to downtown. Yep. And uh, we ended up staying at this place that was like an old temple that was converted to a bougie hotel. Like basically. like a synagogue. It was it, it had a Hebrew on the outside. And apparently the congregation had moved to a, a different building, like a, a bigger building that was like a few blocks away. And they had taken this old, you know, kind of like retrofitting an old church or other kind of religious building into being a hotel. And so we basically stayed at this hotel inside a synagogue. So it was really nice. I want to say it was run by Hyatt. Uh, Yeah, it was one of those like cross-branded, like it's part of that network. Yeah. And when we roll in, it's another one of those places where I'm not sure about the bikes. And then when we get there, the... There was another group of touring cyclists who were already there. Yeah. A previous group had just left that morning (laughs) and more and more cyclists rolled in over the course of the night. Like this place is definitely a everyone who does this trip stops in Syracuse and stays in this area. So it's fascinating, too, because one thing that this riding on the Greenway really brought home to me is because they, you know, New York wouldn't make an infrastructure project without some form of incentive. Like, okay, people are really going to enjoy this or there's going to be like, you know, usually there's a financial incentive behind or infrastructure. Corruption. Could be yeah, corruption. Or corruption, whatever. I, I'm like, you know, Cuomo made this whole plan happen, but <laughs> I, I, don't, I hate him, but I like his bike path. Um, but anyway, I noticed that every town that had the, the path, through it has been <laughs> experiencing increased tourism in in some cases almost predominantly catering toward people going along this trail. So I thought that was really cool and the fact that this is maybe not a main tourist thing but it definitely is a tourist attraction. It was uh it was kind of a neat revelation for me. Yeah. So we have our night we eat at this little local towny place cuz we're basically we're staying. We didn't want to stay in places that were too far away from the trail because that's a pain. So 
We stayed like basically on the edge of the college town yeah. instead of in the downtown proper. And we went there's to a lot Phoebe's. Of, there are a lot of college towny type of restaurants there that were yeah. crowded with college kids yelling at each other. Very alumni grill kind of <laughs> atmosphere. Yep. You know, so, like, you know, where you get your food when you are a sophomore and mooching around at 11 o'clock yep. at night. <laughs> so know? we headed down the road a little bit to like what is clearly the place that people who actually live there and not yeah. necessarily the college crowd eat. Is this little restaurant called what, Phoebe's? So yeah, just a weird aside. So I was talking about this trip. Oh, well, I wasn't even talking about the trip. Um, I found out weeks later that one of my coworkers, one of the QA people was from Syracuse and other people were going to this game convention in Syracuse. I said, they were talking about restaurants. They said, oh, go to Phoebe's. We ate there. And he's like, how did you know about Phoebe's? I'm from Syracuse. So it's like basically, apparently it's locally notable and that people from Syracuse actually go there. And it's very it's a yummy. lot like a secret breakfast in Boston. Yeah. If you're ever there for anime Boston. <laughs> <laughs> so so plus, plus one to that. And uh, then we just kind of, again, took a nice shower, washed our hair, and hung our clothes up to dry in the closet on a hanger. And, and, and now we're, we're good to go. to go. Like, we're nearing the end of the trip. We don't need to do any more laundry. Like, we're not even filling the water bottles or the camelbacks all the way. Like, we're, yeah. we're we, we've, the we've end got, of the line. We've, we've hit our stride. <laughs> we know our good pacing. We know how much effort this kind of thing takes. And we, we kind of... Within certain boundaries, like again, if if events were to stray too far outside of our uh, what we planned for, I think we'd be in a little bit more but of a tight spot. But so we're little is going good. wrong, yeah, and we're past all the desolate segments. Yeah, we're 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 to the point where if something went really wrong, I could call up my parents and they'd be there in a couple hours. Yep, or so- <laughs> I could like we could actually like call a devil car with Uber yeah. to get us and like rent a car and deal with like, yeah. a lot of there, ways. There, there were outs, you know. So we're we're starting to get to the point where in a day or so we're going to be hitting the place I used to play for sports teams when I was in high school. Yep. So the one thing we were a little bit worried about is the weather. It didn't look as bad. It wasn't no like huge storm really, warning. It was scheduled. It looked like it was going to be freezing cold and pouring rain the next day, like unseasonably cold. So we were like, maybe we will stay in or like at worst, we ride 70 miles the last day and have my mom pick us up in Rochester, yada, yada. But we ended up deciding to chance it. And set up bright and early in the morning after a hearty continental breakfast. Up day seven, the last full riding day, 74 miles. It took us under eight hours to do it. A little bit of elevation gain. And this was honestly the most uncomfortable day. <laughs> this was the challenge it day. Was. Not because it was a difficult ride, but because the weather was It was garbage. freezing it cold. It was cold. And it, it was rained raining. constantly the entire day. It was with- just drizzly. And it, the kind of drizzle that just chills you to the bone. And so we were riding out of the city of Syracuse. Syracuse is a pretty big city. And there were some pretty cool buildings too. Those like no, actually, Art in Deco the morning, thing. I'd say the first twenty miles, like it basically actually, follows it was something. Really nice. It follows a path a lot like the Riverwalk yeah. in San Antonio at first. Like it kind of just goes through like downtown Syracuse, and it goes next through, to like, the water on a little path. It goes through a few path. little neighborhoods, and it goes over this bridge. Yeah, and then it's just along the waterfront and beautiful. It's it's a preserve, isn't it? I want to say that like it's it's a place where wild birds are. And like it's it's starting to get into the Finger Lake regions. I want to say that this wasn't the river. This was near a lake. So we're both going along the canal and kind of skirting close. To oh, yeah. That, some that of the very Finger beginning Lake. bit before yeah. we went over the New York State Fairgrounds was uh, Onondaga Lake. Onondaga. Directly. That's right. So, so we do this short segment around the lake and uh, some of the photos I took don't even do it justice. It was it was gorgeous. It was the most it was beautiful. It was really vista. nice. It was just, you know, we're we're it's quiet. We're just like. Going along this kind of marshland in the, you know, the the sky is, you know, slightly overcast, but it's it's morning and we're feeling fresh and bright. <laughs> and then we get to the fairgrounds. That was kind of interesting. So never we been go to those the fairgrounds. State. I never have either, actually. <laughs> but so we we cruise by the state fairgrounds and kind of mooch around through there. 
Then we're on some country roads. Then it starts to get a little bit rainier. Yep. And it's, <laughs> and it's just, it's cold to the point that we just, we stop talking. We're soaking wet. Our teeth are chattering and we're just powering through. So this isn't, this isn't quite like going into Schenectady because Schenectady, we were laughing. Yeah. This is more, we put the grim face of stoicism on and just be like, we would stop. Actually, we were, had a pretty good ratio of being able to figure out when the storm was coming. We'd feel the wind pick up yep, and I'd once say, again, we'd like, hey, we'd pull can over we to go to shelter and eat some pretzels? And so that's what we did. You know, we'd pull over and kind of kind of wait out the rain. And it was fun. But the most important, at one point near the end, we had like 15 miles to go and we were cold enough to where <laughs> it was starting to be a problem. So we leave the trail and go over this bridge and along a road and there's a McDonald's. There's a McDonald's right by there. We're like, okay, we can't like stop, stop here, but let's just go into the McDonald's and get some coffee and yep. just warm up a bit. I'm so glad we did that. And we, you know, again, this was one of the times where we kind of predicted the squall was coming because it would, it would pour I have this photo of our bikes. We just left the bikes outside in yeah. the pouring rain while we're in the McDonald's. <laughs> they look so just desolate. So like, like, you know, not to anthropomorphize my trusty seed, but like, they, they look so sad out by the picnic tables by the McDonald's because they're just like getting absolutely poured on. And then we finally get to the hotel and I actually like look at the bikes. I hadn't really like we're <laughs> well, just powering through when we get. Remember what we were riding through, too. This is when the stone dust stops and we yep. were literally going through the woods on like these little muddy shoots. And just again, totally just like stone faced like. Let's go as fast as we can because there's no stopping. We got to, you know, what was this? The, the old Erie Canal song be yeah. like, you know, miles to go. <laughs> oh, I think my bike had more than a, like pounds of mud. It was it. so dirty. We were so filthy dirty. And we, we pull up. Into Palmyra, right? Which is our, our stop. Yeah, Palmyra is it's basically this little we town, in Palmyra. It's a place I want to say we played in soccer when I was a kid. You and know, the best like western we're staying in is house. actually like a couple miles down the road. Yeah, so we're staying in another best western. We pull into town, this little town called Palmyra, and the sun just comes out. All the rain here- stops, <laughs> the wind stops. It's beautiful. See, it starts getting warm. You see this just like this just incredibly disheveled couple in like neon bike wear, just Caked like in mud. staggering in. We looked like we had Caked been, in mud and dripping. <laughs> been through the trenches. So we found a little cafe, I think it was a cafe aqueduct. And they had, again, maybe I'm talking up the food too much because I was hungry. As well, we heck. come in and we're like, <laughs> would it be a problem if we ate here? If because we, we ate stink here. and we're wet. We are so muddy. gross right now. And they're like, Oh, Oh, sure, that's fine. And we had red wine and lasagna. And I remember it was the, 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 the server was kind of dumbstruck where they were like, oh, where'd you where'd bike you from? from? And we're, we're like, like, Queens. Yeah, well, we were just like, yeah, we came from uh, Syracuse this morning and it rained on us. And she's like, oh, today it was nasty. So. But I got to say, the hardest segment of this entire ride was after having had a beer and a bunch of lasagna and warmed up in this place, going back out into the, like, coldening again oh, weather. Oh, no. It was just, we were really cold. It was, the thing is, it was like the end is in sight. Kind of like, But having to see... leave this warm restaurant, get back on our bikes, yeah. and bike a few miles down a highway to a Best West. It was a country highway. The thing is, it was a lot like that hill up into Hudson. Yep. It absolutely sucked. I think the but problem, at the but same now, time, the, sun was the setting. end was in sight. The sun was setting. It was getting cold again. I was like shaking. Oh, my lips were blue. I was I was like, you know. And we get to the last few Best minutes, Western. We're like into hypothermia territory. And I think we were, uh, there was like, there was some like a wet, there was some sort of like 
like civic event happening there. Yeah. So there were a ton of like old people, well to do looking old people <laughs> dressed up in like business wear having a conference. <laughs> and, and we just like come in. Again, the bike barbarians <sighs> have arrived. And like I said, uh, at least a lot of the places we stayed along the way, like the castle, it's like the bike barbarians regularly rolled in. And so they have kind of a procedure to deal with them. Yeah. So yeah, that was kind of like us. It's like everybody's doing their normal hotel thing. And then like these two goblins you can show tell. up. It took <laughs> us nine hours of saddle time to go 102 miles on day one. Yeah. It took us eight hours of saddle time to go the 73 miles to Palmyra. Yeah, well, day. again, through the woods. <laughs> <laughs> through the we woods were... and the mud and the rain carrying pounds of extra weight. Yeah. So. And that Best Western had a hot tub. Yes. The hot tub. <laughs> that was the other thing. We, we, uh, we again, it dip. was such a weird Best Western, too. This hotel is just like on either side of it are just regular houses. Yeah, it was it was one. It was less like the 1970s motel style and more like the country inn and suites, kind of like the places we get at a Magfest or yeah. those those like uh, timeshare sort of situations. So anyway, we we shower, we take a hot tub bath and get all nice and warm. We and basically <laughs> celebrate. We were done like the next day. Yeah. 26 miles to your granddad's house. And that's it. Like, yeah. We're there. It's, we're it's done. We like, made it. Like we said, 20 miles for us is not that big a trip. And like 20 miles was the shortest time that was going to the castle. This is only 25 miles. And then we have accomplished it. So because the rest day, instead of going all the way, the initial plan was to bike to my childhood home. But so we would have had a full day on this segment. The original plan, we would have biked like 70 ish. I think it was 74 ish yeah. miles to like Rochester proper. But because and then we would have biked an additional distance down all the way to Leroy. Yeah. Like off the trail on a different trail. So because this is day eight, this is this is uh, the the day that we're going to have the memorial. It, it was less of a service. I mean, my family is not super religious. Uh, but it was it was like a, a memorial kind of remembrance day where we all got together and had a barbecue and we had like our deceased relatives ashes and all kind of said our goodbyes because we hadn't really gotten to do that during the pandemic properly. Yep. And, so this uh, last day, we too, we woke up late because we didn't have to go that far. It was freezing cold. So freaking cold. And so I saw the temperature and then I'm like, okay, I dried all my clothes. I hung them up. I am going to put on all my jerseys at once. Yep, I, I wore two bike jerseys and a heat tech shirt. I wore two layers of long sleeve, two layers of short sleeve and my sports bra. On, and, you know, I couldn't really have anything to put on my legs, but like, my legs are a little bit more hardy than my upper body for some reason. So I was just like, I'm going to keep my core warm, just keep moving. And hopefully it was, it was in the forties. I want to say it was like 50 at yep. most. So it was, it was not rainy, but it was overcast and very chilly. It was fully fall by this point. Yep. Like when we got near Fairport uh, at the, where the like fancy boats come and go yeah. and like where you'd had the thing with your granddad before, like yeah. his, his uh his famous 90th, 90th that I talked to you about party. So we're we're we set out, we go back through Palmyra, you know, we get back on the trail, and really it's it's a pretty simple last ride. And the the thing that was the coolest to me was when I started seeing familiar places where it started to be like Rochester, such and such. Yep. Or I started to see p places I've driven past in well, the specifically car. Specifically when we got off the actual Erie Canal like trailway that we've yeah. been taking this whole time and just got on a, a well, bike path that goes through like <laughs> Pittsburgh. So so the cool thing, right, is a couple of these stops like Fairport and Pittsburgh. Uh, the Pittsburgh, I want to say, is where we launched the barge from. And, yeah. you know, we went by the restaurant Aladdin's where we got the Greek food and Medi I guess Mediterranean food. And um, we basically... I was like, oh, I know this place. I know this place. So we're getting close. And I'm starting to feel that like we're in the home stretch kind of feeling. And so in Fairport, we stopped and we got a little coffee. You know, that was kind of our thing, you know, get coffee, warm up. We stopped at a gelato place, but like, heck, we were going to eat gelato on a morning like that. So uh, it was a nice little coffee shop. Had, had that. So 
once we get to Pittsburgh, uh, we we start to deviate from the Erie Canal path into the woods. But it's like again, single track mountain bike trail. This it's was a not full on mountain actual, bike trail. Like this yeah. is a trail that townie, like people who live in Pittsburgh, like kids on their mountain bikes will just ride on. We actually saw some guys, and we they passed us, and they were definitely going, and we saw them going down the trail, like jumping over roots and stuff. No road bike could navigate this trail. <laughs> this. This is the part where people who are into racy bikes, it, you would die. I actually had to walk my bike in a couple places where yep. it was like too many routes. I was happy with how well I acquitted myself without suspensions. Oh, like. and, and with panniers and yeah. all this other stuff. So I was actually pretty proud of myself too. But like the coolest thing is you ever have those dreams where you see a familiar place, but it's like there's a secret tunnel in it or like, you know, it's like, oh, the library from school, but there's like a magical back room or something like that. Yeah, like I been, I think I'd been to some of those strip oh, malls. I didn't know there was a been bike to path. That. I know 100% you've been to that Wegmans. But, but I didn't like, know there was just a bike path behind exactly. it that actually connected to things. So we're in the woods and we can see glimpses through the trees of this shopping plaza that I go to all the time with my family. And I was like, I'm in the secret tunnel. This is amazing. So we know we're close. It, we've gotten to the point where if we blew a tire, we could walk. And so we we found a bunch of these little back bike roads. And then I see the intersection to, to Granddad's house. And then I see Granddad Street. And then I collapse on the lawn and we roll around laughing because we've made it. <laughs> My aunt comes out with her new dog and everybody's there. And everybody was just like, I can't believe you did that. Like, my whole family is there. And like I said, my granddad, he's, he's passed away two years ago. And uh, he actually didn't die of COVID. It was just, he was very old. And, you know, he passed away before the pandemic. And uh, it was my uncle. Actually, two of my uncles live in his house now. But it was so cool to have kind of completed the journey that was like it the idea began at his birthday party on the canal and then it finished after I had biked almost the entirety of the canal and ended up back at the house I knew so well and so after that it was like we changed our clothes and put some sweaters on and it became regular life again yeah. <laughs> we were back there just a shy of 500 miles of biking over the course of a week to get there. So it was, it was really a cool trip. And I feel like it tested our metal. But not in, in the ways I ways. expected because it was like, and I'm not just being flippant about this. It was really easy compared to what we expected. Yeah. I like, thought I would be really more physically easy. tired, but actually my body, you if know. If you had told us like. After like after that day where we rested in Rochester, if you had told us you've got to bike home, like bike the way you came, we could have done it. We could have done it with no trouble. I feel like some of our friends, Cough Scott, he huh? was a bit worried that we were not prepared for it in the way that like we hear about people going out into the woods to hike with their sneakers yep. and stuff. And we're like, oh, man, you're going to like fuck your feet up, watch out, you yep. know, you're going to get hypothermia or dehydration, you know. And I worried about that a little bit myself. Like, am I going to be faced with these challenges? No, am I going over, to be weak? All I could think was this was so easy that we could have done this much earlier in our lives with much less training and preparation and had a great time. But at the same time, it also felt like it, it, was the culmination of it, a lot of stuff for us personally. I'm not speaking for anybody else, but yeah. for us during the pandemic, there was kind of a silver lining. Like, for example, during the food shortages, we ended up reconnecting with some of our local friends because we all started this like food sharing thing from the restaurant supply co or like the fact that we couldn't hang out with people and all we had to do was just physical activities, you know? So it was like, we'd, we'd, we'd ride for miles and miles to stay sane. And this was almost like the reward of all that work. But it wasn't just work. It's like work can also seem 
fun. And this was, it, like I said, it, it's also like incredibly romantic if you're doing yeah. it with your with your partner or yeah, spouse. Yeah, I would not have been as nearly as, like doing it by myself would have been yeah, a very I, I, different I wouldn't experience. have liked to, I mean, I feel like it would have been a very meditative and one of those things that like, you know, people who go backpack through Europe, they're like the journal of my self-discovery. Yep. And I suppose I'd probably be very meditative and think about a lot of stuff on the way. Though, one thing that we did that most people don't do with this kind of touring yeah. is while we rode together and we were mutually supporting, like we carried gear yeah. together, we hung yeah. out together, we didn't like draft each other or do like cycling well, best practices. So we both rode this individually because if you ride in a Peloton and you draft, yeah, trips like this are even easier and faster. I will say though, we I would have struggled. It under our own power. I would have struggled more one with the type of bike <laughs> I have, and two, uh, we do ride at very different paces. So yeah. I feel like a lot of it was when I would get kind of tired out, uh, you would moderate your pace for me. And but I, I wouldn't go was, too slow. We'd still like, we all right, here's the minimum pace that we're going to use to, we keep, kind of was to get like, there before sundown. We always have to be visible to each other, I think was the main idea. Because if we lose the visibility, I mean, we have our cell phones, but I don't, I don't want there to be, because this has happened before in the past when we don't have South. Yeah. It would be like, oh, I've like run on ahead and suddenly I have lost sight of my person. And so, but it really, I just can't recommend this enough. If you have, oh, excuse me, if you have a bike, if you have a little bit of money to stay at Best West, If you can afford <laughs> cheap hotels and time off work. Yeah. It, like, so it it is a, a privilege just like, you know, any sort of travel is a privilege. And again, of course, we you bumped know, into that German guy <laughs> the who German basically guy. went on like sabbatical, I guess, and on a shoestring budget, just bike camped his way from Seattle all the way across the entire United States. Yeah. We bumped into him along the way because there was another spot where there was a detour and he was just like, fuck the detour. Yeah, I'm and just we're gonna like, go. Oh, that's that's ours. So so this this fellow, one, he had or leave panniers. But two, it was like he had biked from Seattle. He'd biked across the entire continental United States. And we actually, we got to play the role of the advice yeah, giver. He was on his way to New York. He was going to New York. Where can I camp in New York? And, and we said, pointed him at Aviator, Aviator Field. Aviator Field. He said, is there a place to camp by the airport? And we're like, yes, Rockaways. Rockaways has a beach. I don't know what the camping stuff is, but you can totally camp in People Aviator Field. People definitely camp in Aviator yeah. Field on a regular basis. So, we have some friends who have spent the night there. <laughs> so basically, we were able to give New York City advice to this traveler. And it's, it's like... It feels almost kind of old fashioned in a way. You imagine people back in the day. I mean, they had to do this. We're just doing this for yeah. fun. But, but like every one we passed, just, they would just like, like whoever initiated contact would shout out their destination, expecting you to tell them your destination. Yeah. Like, oh, we're on to Montreal. Oh, yeah, we're heading like, to Buffalo. Yeah, and you cheer each other on. It's honestly, I just got an incredibly good vibe from specifically the long distance bike touring community that I ran into on this trip. I just thought everybody was incredibly supportive yep. and warm and welcoming. And, uh, and they I, are very different from the like cycling community that you might know and think of who do group rides like on highways. This yeah. is a very different Which is cool. community and a very different kind of cycling. Like, like that's awesome. If that's your jam, like absolutely. But I just found this is more about the idea of meeting the people of the road kind of thing. And it is it is the idea that you have a destination, but the most important thing is the journey getting there mm. and what you see along the way. And like I said, I feel like it gave me a much better appreciation for the just general diversity of experience of my state you know it, from i just wish more <laughs> from states, the bronx to the middle of nowhere it's and nuts, it, but it's nuts it's, that there is a contiguous bike path that is almost entirely off roads yeah between queens and buffalo well to be honest it's on one of the oldest roads in the entire state which yeah. is the waterway it went it was a, a 
made in the early 1800s, I want to say. But the problem the- is there aren't other things like this in America. Like even the other segment that if we just gone north to Montreal, yeah. which would have actually been like a shorter ride than what we did. That's yeah. not that far. That's almost entirely on highways, like just sharing it with traffic. There really aren't bike routes like this anywhere in America except what we just did. Yeah. I just, it it was really good. And I recommend anybody who is local to the area and even people who aren't local, but like, you know, come from yeah. Scotland or Germany. Or hell, or, we're going to go back. I want, we are, or we, the Netherlands. We plan to next year, not do the whole thing again, but we're definitely going to bike up to that segment past Poughkeepsie, like between that whole area between Poughkeepsie and Albany, like especially like with Hudson in the middle and all, that's an area I would just take a long weekend and cycle up and down any summer. Yeah. It's it's good. Good trip. Yeah, get rent a bike. You stay the like go to whatever town is next past Poughkeepsie and just spend a day biking around on this thing and you'll have a real good time, even if you don't bike all the way to Buffalo. And even after a week, your legs will be ripped. Oh yeah. We I, we were so buff. <laughs> My, it was like my pants didn't fit after the trip. Like, no lie, my thighs were too big for my jeans. Not your waist. It's like your literal muscles are just tree trunks by the time you've, you've gone hundreds of miles. And then one of the last coolest things is after a couple of days in Rochester, you're like, we'd go back to work. Yeah. We just got on the Amtrak and took a sleeper car. Pretty much the route we biked, we took back on a train in a sleeper car. I could see the Utica sign when we went through Utica. I was like, "There's that neon sign that." We At a bunch of points past. along the way, we would see like we would places see the we trail. Stopped. We would not just that. We could see the canal and we could see the trail at various points along the way, and it was so cool because one. I will recommend Amtrak is a great way to get your bike around, but you got to be careful to book the proper you gotta, train. You got to like super check because, because every specific numbered train has different bike rules. And the, even if you, even if they allow bikes, they all allow bikes in different ways. Yeah. Some need reservations, some don't. Some you have to take the whole bike apart and put it in a box. You don't want to do that. Don't. So what we did is that we went on the Lakeshore Limited, which is not only is it one of the few trains that has the overnight sleeper cars as it goes to Chicago, but there were also um, baggage compartment. And so you can, they have a bike rack in there that they literally chain your bike up. They put a baggage tag on it and then you just check it and you come and pick it up, just ride it right off the train. Well, not ride it, but you walk it off the train in yep. Penn Station. So we, we, we're in this little roomette. We got our like yep, we were Amtrak. Talking about, I thought it was a geek noise all the time. Yeah. But, uh, Roomettes the, are great. I love Amtrak, Amtrak by the way. sleeper cars are kind of a hack because most people who use Amtrak don't know they exist. Or, or if they, they know they exist, they assume that they're really expensive. And sometimes they are. But if you book early enough in advance, they're like bucks. buy two coach tickets and then pay like an extra hundred bucks on top of that. Yeah. And you get dinner Wine and a completely a private room with bed. two lay down beds in it. <laughs> so for an eight hour trip, because it does take eight hours from Rochester. Because well, it took us eight days to bike up. <laughs> yeah. so. so it was about an hour worth of train per day. Um, but it was like, it takes eight hours because they switch over in Schenectady. No, Albany Red Salir. Yeah. Right. And so we we're like, hey, there's the bike path. And we we're pointing down when we we're like, go past the, the Albany place. And so. Um, and the weirdest coda of the whole trip was we get off the bikes in, uh, you know, Penn Station at the end of the uh, whole thing. The we're back Moynihan, in New York. we got a fancy new train haul. So if you come to New York, take the Amtrak out of Moynihan. And we're going to head home. And then we, you know, we get off the train. We've got our bikes and we're standing outside Penn Station. And then we just bike home. Yeah, we're like, like, why get on the subway? We've, <laughs> yeah. got the bikes. We've, we've got bikes. We're like, we don't want to take our bikes on the, the E train. So we just like, hey, want to do our commute? Yeah, might as well. And so we just, after an eight hours of train, we just biked over the Queensboro and then we're home. And and that was, uh, it was so strange. It was such a, such a thing that I've always dreamed about doing, but never actually thought was str- possible. And then was way more possible than I actually the strangest imagined. moment for me was very specifically at right after we got past Albany, like when we made the left turn and we started heading the other way, I suddenly dawned on me that we were past Albany and all we'd done is gotten on <laughs> our bikes and started pedaling like literally from 
right across the street of our apartment. Like we walked out of our apartment, got on our bikes, and then we were past Albany, still on our bikes. Human that, powered technology. Well, Basically, we just l- did a little like gear and like Scott, we turned Scott the said, gear enough with our own physical even energy. Some, some of our friends along the way, like we're like, holy shit, like, like dumbstruck that we were biking that far. Yeah. And our friend Scott, you know, Scott of Geek Nights fame said it best. He's like, People who don't cycle drastically underestimate the brutal efficiency of a bike. And that was bikes a great are, quote from Scott. I bikes love are that. so efficient. You don't need to be a super athlete. Like, don't think that we're just super fit and we made this work. Us being I mean, super we fit, were we were really ambitious when it came to our mileage. No, but, but us being super fit is how we did it in seven-ish days. Most people do a trip like this in two weeks, and that's totally expected. If you get to the point where you can bike 30 to 40 miles in a day, like all day with breaks, with eating, with everything, like with taking your time, you could do a trip like this if you can take the time off work. Yeah. I I honestly, biking might be my absolute favorite sport that I've ever done. And I will say I recommend it for almost anybody. If you can bike, you should. Yeah. Because it's great. 